Greetings, Bat Family. Welcome back to Holy Batcast, brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. Make sure you visit our website, holybatcast.com, or find us all over social media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for Holy Batcast. You will find us. If you love the show, you want to help support us, you can do that on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash holybatcast. And a big thank you to our patrons. Guess what? We got a new one, uh, Mr. Julian Espinoza. Hello, Julian. Thank you for becoming a patron. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. So big shout out to Julian this week. I guess that's what he wanted to do for Christmas is to support a podcast. So thank you for that. And again, thank you to all of you who've done it. Uh, we it really does mean the world to us, and we appreciate it. So big thanks to Julian and all our patrons. We are part of the Real Fans Podcast Network. If you want to check out all those shows, you can check them out at rf4rm.com. And as always, I am your bat host, your bat buddy, your bat pal, Andy DiGenova. You can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. It's just my name, Andy DiGenova. This episode, we are going to be looking back at Season 3 of Titans. Now that it has wrapped up and is now readily available uh, outside of North America on Netflix. thought this was a good time to look back and see what we thought. We also have the next episode of Batman Beyond for you. That's right, two weeks in a row. We're committed. We're so close. We're in the home stretch. So joining me for all this fun, it's my good pal, Mr. Jamie Drewley. Good morning, Jamie, and uh, welcome back. Well, thank you. It's delightful to be here on this chilly December morning. And uh, you, you say we're committed to that show. I'd say more we're committed to the idea of being done with it. At least I am. That's my perspective. Well, I mean, tomato, tomato. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> when you said this chilly December morning, I just heard, ah, the cold chill of, uh, of uh, whatever, winter morn, and an asshole in his bathrobe emptying a chemical toilet into my sewer. I mean, don't we all think about that this time of year? <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many people around here, and I'm sure this has been the case everywhere over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, especially, that have gotten mannequins dressed in a short white bathrobe. Really? And everything else. Oh, yeah. Really? They're, they're, yes. Okay. There, There's one house that's over by our old neighborhood that we moved out of five years ago that does it where they literally have like a hose, like a tube that they're standing over the storm drain by in front of their house that they have water flowing through. Wow. And he's got like his hand up waving with the beer can in it and the whole world. I mean, they, they went all out with this thing. That's impressive. Water feature. Good for them. I am. I, it is what December 11th, December 12th. Now I think it's 12th, December 12th. 12th. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> I think I will finally be done decorating the outside of my house on Tuesday. Because I'm still, so I'm just waiting for one two more. weeks before Christmas. Yeah, I'm just waiting for one or two more things. It's been an ongoing process, which is why I haven't even posted a photo yet. Because I'm like, oh, well, I'm still waiting on that one other thing. Oh, I still want to tweak that. I still want to change that. It's just like, I feel like I'll be done December 24th, just in time for Santa to see. Hey, some people's tradition is to buy the Christmas tree on December 24th. So who are we to judge? I know, but pretty happy with it. I feel like I put a respectable effort out for my first year in this house. You, you, it, it seems like when it comes to especially exterior decorating stuff, it's just, it's never enough. You're never done. Yeah. Well, like and then the, the Halloween stuff, we add stuff to that every year. The Christmas stuff, not so much. Well, I mean, we've, we've basically replaced a few items. Like she, she's gotten these, these large, like ornament bulbs that are, I don't know, probably about not quite the size of a volleyball. And she's bought out like the local hardware stores when they go on clearance, the on boxing day, and all that other stuff. And we've replaced a lot of the white strands with those because mm-hmm. number one, they're beautiful. And number two, they, they seem to hold up better than just like the standard cheap strands of light. So yeah. we've done that, but we, we haven't added a lot to our, our Christmas repertoire. That's all right. I mean, one at a time. Last weekend, was it last weekend? I think it was. Maybe it was two weekends ago. Um, you know, we did most of the outdoor decorating and we did what we thought was smart and we bought a strand of 1,000 outdoor LED lights. A it single was, strand with 1,000? Yes. Oh, it, good luck untangling that. It was not smart. Yeah, it, it was a bad idea. It sounded like a good idea of like, oh, this one purchase and we can decorate the whole house. But because it's so damn long, 
uh, it's prohibitive. And yeah, it, it, it easily gets retangled and then you have to untangle it. And long story short, I spent two and a half hours out there getting it all up and everything. And uh, then I plug it in and it doesn't work. Oh, and then you have to go through and figure out where the bulb's missing. So, oh no, I just tore the whole fucking thing down and and I'm returning it. I wasn't playing that game. <laughs> so you didn't plug it in before you put it up? No, we plugged it in when they came and they worked fine. Okay. But somewhere over the course of the two and a half hours of putting them up, something went wrong. I don't know if something got kinked, something got stepped on. I have no idea. They did not work. I was not going to try and figure out why because I hated putting them up anyway because they were, again, with that huge of a bundle, it was really hard. Um, and that's fresh out of the box. Imagine what putting them inside the storage tote and getting them back out next year would be like. Yeah. So Because you, you guys think your, your, your earbuds, back when we used to have cords on these things before the, the wireless ones, you think those going in your pocket were a tangled up mess. Man, Christmas lights take the cake. Yeah. So note to self, guys, it might sound good of like, oh, one string and it covers everything. No, get a bunch of smaller ones that can be connected because it's going to be a lot easier. And maintenance is is significantly easier. Figuring out where the problems at are easier because instead of having the whole 1000 be dead, you'll have like a single section of it that's dead. So you just know that's the section where you have to go hunting for. But untangling Christmas lights, man, that's like my duty every year. Like Kimbra is, is masterful at getting like the decorations done and testing the lights. And, you know, I'm terrified of heights. So she'll get up on a ladder and do the stuff. Whereas I'll just hold the ladder and not do it. But, you know, untangling the lights is like what I have to do. And it's, it's time sticking. It sucks. Yeah, for sure. So I, I feel the pain every year when I watch national lampoons Christmas vacation and he hands that big ball of lights to Russ. He's like, there's a little knot here. You work on that, Russ. I, <laughs> I feel that pain every time I watch that movie. Yep. Anyway, point is, my house is going to be done soon. Can't wait. Uh, just a couple more things I'm waiting on, and, and it'll be good to go. Uh, but let's talk about some DC stuff, and the dog agrees. Yes, she absolutely wants to talk about DC. All right, so here we go. Uh, like I said, Titan Season 3, it came out in August. It wrapped up in October, uh, but we were waiting for a number of reasons. First, just waiting for the right week where we don't have anything else big to talk about. Uh, waiting for you to finish the season. Uh, waiting for now it's available to more people again. It, I think it hit Netflix last week because I know a lot of our overseas friends are finally getting to catch up on it because it's finally on Netflix because the season has wrapped up. So yeah, let's uh, take a look back at season three of Titans. Okie dokie, it premiered on HBO Max August 12th, and it wrapped up on October 21st. Uh, we get to go to Gotham in Season 3 of Titans, so we have the emergence of the Red Hood. Well, we have the death of Jason Todd, the emergence of the Red Hood. We've got Jonathan Crane causing trouble, first at Arkham and then out in the wild in Gotham. At the same time, you've got complications with Blackfire and Starfire. Is she good? Is she bad? Is she somewhere in between? Uh, we lose some people along the way. Actually, we lose a lot along the way, and then some come back, but we'll get into that. Um, and uh, the whole public opinion turns on the Titans, so a lot packed into Season 3 of Titans. Uh, I feel like I've even barely scratched the surface. But I want to start spoiler free for the folks who haven't quite caught up yet uh just to be safe so we'll spoiler free thoughts and then i will give a spoiler warning so we can talk about specifics of what we thought of some of the different uh big swings that this season did um so yeah spoiler free i know you just wrapped up what'd you think of season three and especially how it compares to seasons one and two well i mean seasons one and two i both really liked a lot but i think a lot of us shared the opinion of the show is is solid enough, or some of us even thought really good. You know, so you, it was it was pretty positive, but it's like they couldn't close out a season really well with those first two tries. Mm -hmm. This time, they came out of the gate so strong. After watching, I think it was the second or third episode, I thought, and even said out loud, "This is the best that this show has been yet." And then at some point. 
that took a shift. And I thought, well, maybe they're getting that that soft, you know, that they, they can't get the ending quite right. Maybe now they're going to have a little bit of softness in the middle, but that ending is going to be really strong. And it just, for me, I can't speak for anybody else. For me, I just gradually lost more and more interest to the point where you suggested to, to do this episode and I had to cram the last six in because I didn't even really want to watch them because I was just fed up with the show at that point. And I, I hate being that negative about it, but I mean, it's just, I'm not doing anybody any good by sugarcoating this. I just, I didn't care for it. I think the, the show degenerated as it went and I just don't think it ever made any kind of a significant recovery. And quite frankly, I don't know that if this is where they're going to take the show, I don't know that I need a fourth season or will would even necessarily watch one without some kind of outside motivation. Well, you have an outside motivation with this show. I know. That's why I said it that way. Uh, <laughs> I'd say, no, I don't want to watch it, but somebody's going to make me, I think. Most likely. And, you know, I... I, I love the DC universe, so I mean I'm I'm more prone to giving it a shot, but I don't dislike the show. And I, I think they 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 make choices with the show that I don't necessarily understand, but you know, okay, you want to do something different, do your own thing, that's fine, but it's just not not really appealing to my better sensibilities for what what this show has the potential to be. And I, I just like the CW shows. I don't really dislike any of the CW sh- like Arrow. I, di- I wasn't crazy about Arrow, but like the uh, Flash, Supergirl, Legends. I, I, I like those shows. I just that time commitment. And, and, you know, since I cut the cord and don't have the DVR anymore and I don't want to watch on the CW app with the commercials. So then I'm at the mercy of do I want to binge 23 episodes when it hits Netflix or HBO Max? And the answer is no, I don't. So I just I. Resign myself to with those to I don't really want to be committed to these because there's too much other content out there for me to watch right now. Yeah. I've kind of lumped Titans in with that category after this season. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think I liked it more than you did, which, I mean, that checks out. That's par for the course. Um, I will say when Titan season one came out, like I you know like i loved it and i couldn't get enough of it and it was sort of my favorite thing happening when it was on um and that i don't quite feel that way uh now that we're well we just wrapped up season three uh i i was a little less on top of it this season than i've been in the past so i agree with you that it's a mixed bag but overall i still really like it um there's a lot to like here and so i've seen a lot of fans who feel like you did or, or, you know, I saw quite a bit from other DC fans who were like, oh, I'm done with this show or, or who really are hating it. And, you know, that's fair. You know, everyone's everyone's got their take. But I, I feel like that's still a bit harsh because there's so much I still enjoy about the show. But I said this on a, not a recent episode, but I said it maybe about halfway through the season. To me, what's so frustrating is that they have all the pieces for a great show. And sometimes this show is great, but then they just keep getting in their own way. Um, they overthink things. They, you know, they they're trying too hard to push these characters outside of their boxes or to do something so drastically different with the story that I think that it works against them instead of it instead of being exciting and being like, oh my god, I can't believe what they've done. It's more like, oh my god, I can't believe what they've done. Like, do we really need that? <laughs> um, so I feel like they just they have everything they need and there's so much i love the cast i love the characters i love the design i like a over the overarching story i really like um there's a lot there is a lot to like but i just think that they the showrunners they they're so determined to not to make it not a normal superhero show that i think they they just do things just for the sake of doing them mm-hmm. instead of instead of like what would feel like maybe the safer route, but also that also might be the more entertaining route. It might be a little truer to the characters. So I think that this actually needs like to just take a step back and be like, it's a Titans show. Embrace being a Titans show. Uh, It's a Titans show that seems bound and determined to never let the Titans just be a cohesive unit. 
Mm-hmm. Every season, they just want to continue to break them up, and it's like, guys, come on, like, like, give me one season where they're working together as a team. And sure, there can be disagreements and there can be drama it's, within the team, but let's see you them know, working I, I together. Mentioned, I mentioned when this this season came out of the gates, I thought it was the best it's ever been. Do you know why that is? Because that's because how it started. That's what it felt like they were leaning towards. Yeah, that's how it started. Exactly that. Yeah. I mean, if you want to call the show Nightwing with special guests Starfire and, and Connor and, and Gar and all that stuff, I, I get it. But the damn show is called Titans. Let them be the Titans. Yeah. So that's what's frustrating, I think, for me and for a lot of fans. Um, and then, yeah, I guess, again, some of the some of the character choices they make, I think, are fine. And then some, uh, it just feels like too much where it's like. I get what you're going for, but you don't have to go that hard on it. You know, uh, it almost feels like it's done just for shock value or whatever. Um, so, but all that is to say, I, I still enjoyed the season. I still looked forward to each new episode. Um, it's funny cause I don't think that where season one and two, where a lot of folks, a lot of folks agree is season one and two both started really, really strong. And, and then they kind of botched the ending this one doesn't feel as clear cut as that. I feel like there were more peaks and valleys throughout the season. And I thought the ending was, was fine. I didn't think the ending was as disappointing as the other two seasons. Um, but I also think that it was more of a, a mixed bag getting there. So that's where I'm at. I still do like the show. Uh, I still look forward to season four, which it has been renewed for. Um, I just get frustrated sometimes cause <laughs> it's just, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, so stop overthinking it guys. And, and just, give us the Titans show that, that we all want to see. Um, I will say the new additions this season, especially Barbara Gordon is Barbara Gordon was awesome. I love her. I thought that the writing on her was really good. I thought the, uh, the actress was great. She was terrific. So there's stuff here. I know that there's some disagreement about Jonathan Crane. Um, I think that, I liked the actor. I liked what he was doing. But again, some of the stuff that they had, some of the decisions they made for Jonathan Crane, I thought were a little silly. I, I think that's kind of the, the ballpark where you're going to get everybody to converge and agree is I, I went with a lot of what they were doing with Crane, but it was odd. Like the, there, there are just simply choices made with him. Like at the beginning, I was like, okay, we're going to do something a little different. Let's see where this goes. I, I was patient with it. And then after about four episodes of it, I realized where they were, they weren't going to take him in any other direction, but that one. And I was just done with it. Yeah. And you know, I, I said, going into this, I didn't want him to be behind a jail cell playing the Hannibal Lecter advisor character for the whole season, which, you know, he had a little bit of that, but that wasn't like the primary focus. But then they they missed on so many opportunities after the fact with him that I just, I don't know. And th this is petty. I know this is petty. Please don't crucify me for this. But all I could think about looking at that actor, and he did a fine job with the performance. I'm not criticizing that at all. But all I could think of when I looked at him was Tim Allen's co-host on uh, Home Improvement. Oh, geez. <laughs> really? <laughs> it just that's, that's all I could see looking at him is, is he looks so much like that guy. Okay. Uh, I want to talk more about Jonathan Crane when we get into spoilers, but sure. I, yeah. again, I, I, I thought the actor did a really good job. I just think that much like the rest of the show, they had the overall arc they had for Jonathan Crane, I think was good, but I think that they just held themselves back in weird places and then did some weird stuff in some places. And again, it was like, why did you have to make it that messy? Like you you already had what it it needed to be and i liked him as the big bad for the season i think that's fun i love the character um so i was cool with that of of the way he gets out of arkham and then you know continues to to wreak havoc um i do think maybe the season would have been a little stronger if it also seemed determined to like not let jason todd be you know truly a villain at this point and the same thing with blackfire that caught me off guard as i thought blackfire was going to be the secondary villain and i was looking forward to that but they sort of declaw her pretty early on and 
I don't know. I just think it would have been stronger if she had truly come out swinging and been a real problem instead of being a reluctant ally. I, I have no idea what the uh, the takes are on Blackfire Gorn any which way. Uh, I don't know the actress's name, forgive me. She's absolutely lovely. She turned in a fine performance, but quite frankly, I hated Blackfire's character. All right. I, I just, it did nothing for me at all. I didn't. I didn't mind the character, but again, I think that she works better as a villain, and maybe later then she comes to a an understanding with Corey, but they rushed that, and it was like, well, so why is she here? <laughs> uh, so and, anyway. and that that was that was one of my my chief issues with Jason, like the way that they portray Jason Todd and and the the design of red hood and and all of that is is great and the actor playing him is is great he's he's perfect because i hate jason as a character generally and he just plays it so well that i mean that's to me that's jason todd yeah in Mm -hmm. in pretty much almost every way it can be the problem i have with him is i feel like they tried to cram about 15 years worth of story into 13 episodes with him yeah i think that's fair So let's get over but, the spoiler you know, wall. You, you, also, you also have that thing that you, you often say with, with movies of don't hold anything back for the sequel because you don't know if you're going to get one. So, I mean, maybe they were concerned they weren't going to get renewed for season four. I mean, the, these, these shows on HBO Max seem to be a little bit touch and go anyway. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with, I, I just I feel like there was much more that they could have chewed on, expanded on with him and, and done – some other things later on in a different season. I mean, I, I just feel like it was kind of, I, I hate using the term rush because it's become so popular as a criticism for people who just don't like something that's happened with the show. That's what they say is they rushed through it and they didn't take their time. But in, in the case of Jason Todd and red hood, I, I just really think they tried to put too much and too short of a, a window. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Now, I, I, let's get over the spoiler wall because I want to talk about that uh, in a little more detail. So, uh, guys, uh, Titan season three, uh, mixed bag, much like the first couple seasons. I still like it. For me, it's still worth my time. I still look forward to it when it comes out. Um, Jamie, a little less so. And again, yeah, I know that the fans out there are all over the place as far as that goes. So this is one that, you know, not everyone seems to agree on, and that's fine. Uh, but... <clears throat> We do want to speak freely about season three, so if you worry about being spoiled, uh, this is maybe a good time to fast forward and get to the episode of Batman Beyond. But uh, there you go. You've been warned. So spoilers are A-OK in three, two, one. Well, let's get straight to it, because I know you and I will have this same criticism. I said I didn't want Crane to be the, the advisor, and I also didn't want him running around without a mask for the whole season. And at some point, it was pretty late in. I'm going to say it was probably 10 or so episodes in. He's down in the damn bat cave. He's got the mask. Yeah. He's got it in his hands. Yeah. And then they pull that whole, the time for masks is over bullshit. And I'm like, oh, that, that's where the show truly and fully lost me for the season. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I, again, I liked him and I liked the arc of he starts as an advisor. They think they can almost trust him. He manipulates... Like, I didn't mind that he's the one who manipulates Jason Todd. I actually thought that was an interesting new angle on it. I, I like that because then he uses that to then escape and really turn the tables. He, he he lets Jason think he's in charge until he's not anymore. And now you realize Crane knows what he's doing. But once he escapes, yeah, like, now it's time for the Scarecrow's reign of terror on Gotham. And the fact that they don't fully commit to that and yes, of course, he should be wearing a costume. He should be the scarecrow, um, especially because this show is so good about putting almost all of the characters in really great comic book accurate costumes. Yeah, the um, designs are fantastic. Yeah, for everybody all of them that's worked. are so good. Um, this show shouldn't hold back on the big villain for the season. That doesn't make any sense. But then they also do this really weird angle that. To my knowledge, I have never known to be true for the Scarecrow, uh, where he's got two personalities, where essentially Jonathan Crane is a different personality than the Scarecrow. And I was like, why? What? What is that? That's a two-faced thing. Why are you making it Scarecrow, where he's like 
and that's they almost use that as sort of a half-assed explanation as to why he's not putting on the mask and going and being the scarecrow because he's trying to prove that Jonathan Crane can be just as evil as the scarecrow. And it's like, wh- why? Who needs that? How does that add to the story? It just feels like an extra layer of silliness that doesn't help anything. And really, it just feels untrue to the character. Jonathan Crane is the scarecrow. He's not. He doesn't have this internal conflict of, of is, it, is, is Crane in charge or is the scarecrow in charge? It's, it's just stupid. Why do it? I, I don't know. And and even the, the point where he had like that uh, that scythe or whatever it was on the chain, he's like, oh, look, Batman saved my weapon. I'm like, well, at least he's going to use that. No. Yeah. Like they had all of these incredible things in the trophy case that, that were readily available to use, especially for him. And, and that, that mask looked great. I would have just liked to have seen him put it on and do something, you know? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And and I was very happy when I was like, when I kind of saw where it was going of like, oh, he's not just going to be in the cell the whole time. He is using these events to get free. I was like, good, then he can be free. And then the Scarecrow can like really just wreak havoc. That's what I was looking forward to. And they they just half-assed it. And it was really frustrating as a as a fan of the character. So I don't really hold it against the actor. I do hold it against the writing where you were there. You were, you were, you, you had what you needed. Why did you stop? It was so silly. Um, you know, like, cause of the nonsense of him and I've only watched the season once. I I didn't rewatch it all before this episode. So I will certainly forget details. Forgive me. But yeah, where he like, kidnaps the pizza delivery guy and then he's like trying to prove to himself that he can kill him without being the scarecrow and i'm like again like why i mean i felt that pain too because 25 dollars for a pizza is a little on the steep oh side. oh for sure i mean i guess he deserved to die for that <laughs> <laughs> but so <clears throat> yeah it would it could have been great and it was okay but yeah it just it, it was just you know, not quite there. And then talking about Red Hood, Jason Todd, like the way the season started was great. Like where we see, uh, you know, the death of Jason Todd, then we see the reemergence and then he's God, he's, he's just a complete bastard as he should be. Um, I mean, the thing with the thing with Hank, I had sort of been spoiled on that. <laughs> um, so watching those, ep- or maybe it was just the one episode, but watching that episode was even more painful because I was like, oh, I don't think, I don't think Hank's going to make it. And I love Hank. I love Hank and Dawn. I think they're great. But I was like, oh, shit. I do too. But if you, if you recall, I, I said the first two seasons had enough episodes that were just truly, you know, focused on them. Yeah. So I didn't need that in this season. And then all of a sudden there's one called, Hank and Dove or whatever that episode was called. I was like, oh shit, here we go again. But that episode was good. I, I really did like it. Yeah, it yeah. Um, so, I mean, the the death of Hank was was intense and it was, I was like, oh my God. And, it, and I have very mixed feelings in that I give them respect for taking a big swing like that. And on the other side, I'm like, oh, but I still really like Hawk and Dove and I don't want, I don't want them off the, I don't want the, uh, the possibility of them coming back to be off the table. So that I I always get, you know, I'm always bummed when they kill one of our heroes and I was like, Oh damn. But again, it it really shows like where Jason has gone. And then the show almost immediately starts trying to redeem him where Dick wants to trust him. Dick wants to try and protect him and help him. And everyone's like, he just killed Hank. And I agree with you. Like let the red hood be a villain this season. Just let him be a villain. And then maybe, towards the end of the season, you give just a hint that maybe he's not beyond redemption. You and, know, And I, I like the idea of the setup with Hank in that uh, Dawn has the, the gun. And oh, like, God, you know, that was, yeah. The only, the only way you can save him is to, you know, shoot me. And, you know, Dick's trying to stop her and everything else. And then she, she pulls the trigger, and it turns out that the gun is the detonation device for the, the explosive. Yeah. I mean, that was a good setup. And the way that you can redeem Jason from that is, yes, he set this trap, but he's not actually the one that, air quote, pulled the trigger. Right. So, I mean, the door was left open for that, and I get that that process, but I, I did really like that setup a lot. I mean, no, that's, I agree. That's, that's 
it was hard on the emotions because now she has to blame herself because she, she didn't want to pull the trigger anyway. Yeah. But she thought that was the only way that she could save him. And it turns out that that was the way that he was going to die. I mean, that, that was, that was good. I, no, I, I agree. I like that. Whole there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, maybe it's because Alan Richson uh, is now doing that Jack Reacher series. So that's why he's like moving on. It's okay if you kill me. I will also say though, just like as a, I love him. I think he's great as Hank. I, again, I, I have a soft spot for Hawk and Dove anyway, so I never had the problem you did. I was always happy to see them. Um, and I think that the two of them are just a perfect live action Hawk and Dove. But I do love that even though Hank dies and in this season, death meant nothing because almost everyone <laughs> came back from the dead. Um, cause think about it. Donna came back from the dead. Tim came back from the dead. Jason came back from the dead and Dick came back from the dead, right? Four. Yep. <laughs> it's a bit much. It's a bit much guys. Um, Hawk is the only one who didn't come back. Um, but there was the whole episode of Donna, Hank and Tim in the afterlife, which I thought was cool. I thought it was a bit, there was, I thought it went on a, a bit too much, a bit too long. I, I was just getting ready to say the concept was great, but I didn't need a whole episode dedicated to that. Exactly. Like it didn't need to be the whole episode, but I thought it was kind of interesting, especially that the, it's an interesting combination of those three characters. Um, but what I did like about it was I liked that Hank had a final heroic moment to make sure that Donna and Tim made it back. Um, and then I thought it was a really nice touch to reunite him with his brother in the afterlife. It was. I to give quotes happy ending he might you know he is dead he's not coming back but we know he's been reunited with his brother and the two of them get to be together uh as hawk and dove in the afterlife until you know until dawn someday makes it there too i thought that was a really nice touch and closing for hank that it sort of softened the blow of having to watch him explode (laughs) yeah so i i did like that um one I, one thing I want to address because I'm not sure I'm clear on this, so maybe you can help me out your your attention to detail. Mine was my little. I, I did a lot of laundry folding and such in these last couple of episodes, so uh, bear with me as I try to recall some of this. Did Bruce Wayne try to kill himself in a fire in that castle? It seems that way, yes. Because I don't like that choice at all. If that's what they're showing, I don't either. At all, I don't either. That and that's exactly what I'm talking about. Where I'm like, Bruce Wayne. Like, because they also imply that he kills the Joker, right? Yes. He kills the Joker after Jason Todd. And then because of that, he is so disappointed and upset with himself that he leaves Gotham. I think that's okay. I think, but again, I think it's like, it's like one step too far. He didn't have to kill the Joker. He could have almost killed the Joker. And because he lost control, he's like, I'm not worthy of being Batman. I need to leave. Like, I think that's fine, but actually having him kill the Joker seems a bit too much. And then him, like, leaving Gotham because he feels like he is he's let himself and everyone else down, that's fine. But then to try actually have him try and kill himself, that's too much. Like, that's where I'm like, I'm like, guys, you don't need and to it, go it, that on, far. No, absolutely not. And on top of that, I feel like it was kind of flimsily handled. Like, it just... Out of the blue in that one episode, he he's walking around dumping the gas in that room and then lights the match and it just I I don't know I I didn't like any of the way that that was handled. No, I agree. Uh, to to address what you're talking about with the Joker, I mean it's a soap opera trope that I mean beat somebody till they're in a coma, almost kill them, cripple them, you know any of that kind of stuff. Uh, it, it's a trope, but it's there for a reason so that you can do that sort of thing and still have that character around for something else later. Yeah, you know it's I I. I freely admit i i can't stand that kind of a trope but i mean that that's that's closing a pretty permanent door well i i I say that but then this whole episode the the whole season deals with resurrection so i mean who's to say that they're not going to drop joker's corpse into a lazarus pit at this point too so i i don't know it's so kind of a scatterbrained season for me and i just i i want to like it i really liked it starting out i just as it went on from about the fifth or sixth episode on. So the last episode I watched before my scarathon kicked in, which, you know, I didn't watch anything but that for a while, uh, which I think is, I think is why 
both of us fell behind because I think that's why I fell behind too is because right. it was wrapping up in October and by then you and I were, were in Scarathon everything else has to wait and honestly that's where I am right now with Christmas is like I'm behind on everything I'm behind on Doom Patrol which by the way has still been terrific but I'm behind on it because I'm in Cheerathon <laughs> come January I have a lot of catching exactly. up to do exactly uh, the hell was I saying sure oh um, the last episode I watched before all that stuff really kicked in was the one where Crane escapes out in the forest or wherever that was at. Yeah. And to that point, I was really pretty much into the show. Mm-hmm. Like that episode, I wasn't – that episode, the one just before it, I wasn't like overly crazy about. But I'm, I'm still into it. And then I came back right after Scarathon wrapped up, you know, the early November and watched that next episode. And I'm like, well – and then I just kind of dragged feet for the last five or six and then – had to watch them for the show and I just it progressively just I mean there, there was some up and down to it but I just progressively lost more and more interest as it went on mm-hmm. I think because I realized I wasn't going to get what I was hoping for wanted really felt like was the right direction and you know that's as much on me as anything you know everybody's got their personal wants and tastes well but I think I I don't think you're out of line because I think that's what we all want from this show it is. And, and like and, I and I'm not saying I want a I want no conflict. I'm not saying I want everything to just be hunky dory because that's boring. But the show just seems bound and determined to not give us what we want. And I don't think it's just me and you. I think it's all the fans because again, I see a lot of these reactions from a lot of our DC fan friends uh, that are very similar to what we're saying. So I don't think it is a, it's out of line to ask for that. And when the season starts, it's funny because it's like the first episode of the season has this moment where, you know, the Titans bring down these bad guys and it's a great sequence. And it's you're like, oh, man, this is what I want. Right. I want the Titans working as a team, bringing down bad guys. And it's when they're still in San Francisco. And then when they're done, the press is like the Titans have done it again. And you realize, oh, somewhere between seasons two and three, the Titans have become these publicly beloved heroes. And that's what we want to see. And then as soon as we get a taste of it, then everything goes wrong again. And I'm sorry to do it, but it's, it's what I was saying. It was the problem with BVS is that there was a year and a half between Man of Steel and BVS where Superman uh, becomes the world's hero, but they didn't want to show it to us because someone thought that was boring, but it's like, no, we, we want to see those beats. This is doing the same thing. It's like, oh, don't worry. It was between the seasons, but we don't want to show you that. We want to, We want them to break up again. And it's like, no, like I, want, I want to see them together for a while before they're, they break up again. So that that is the frustrating part because I do think that there's something to be said for the arc. And I, I didn't even dislike it where at the beginning of the season, yeah, like the world is, they know who the Titans are. They love the Titans. Starfire is famous, right? Like that, I mean, they're all famous, but Starfire is the one they really talk about. And through the the events of the season at a certain point the public is misled because of jonathan crane and because of the red hood that the titans are actually the cause of these problems and everyone starts to turn on them um i think that's okay and i think that that's a valid story but you didn't give us enough of showing the world embracing them to then show the world turning against them you guys were too big in too big of a rush to have the world turn against them you know I, I think I agree with almost all of that. Like, at least give us, like, the first half of this season to to settle into that idea and them to develop. And then by the midway point of the season, they're media darlings and everything else. And then maybe give us that conflict, you know? Yeah. So I, I think we're on the same page there. Yeah, for sure. So I, I think that is part of the frustration for... Uh, for viewers and for fans. Um, there's still some really good stuff in there. Like, I think it was pretty early in the season. There was a really great... Um, a really great fight between Red Hood and Nightwing uh, pretty early on. And I always get nervous about that. I'm like, I'm like, Nightwing will always take down Jason Todd. Sorry, that's the rule. Maybe. It, <laughs> um, and he does. He wins. Like anytime Nightwing fights Jason Todd, he wins because he should. He is he is better. Um, but it's always some external force that that causes Jason Todd to get the upper hand. So that happens when they're like out in the woods with the, with the cabin and everything. And then it happens later on when, you know, after Gotham has decided that the Titans are to blame and they think Red Hood is some hero, they fight. Nightwing still wins, but then this jackass <laughs> shoots him. <laughs> um, and it's like Dick's weakness is that 
he trusts people, right? His weakness is he expects these people to do the right thing. And then when they don't, that's what ends up biting him in the butt. So I thought that was all pretty good too. But by the time Dick does get shot, like we said, too many people have had failed close calls with death where it's hard to really go, you know, I mean, I still was like, oh God, you know, and then I'm like, you little a-hole, how dare you shoot Nightwing? Um, But at the same time, I'm like, well, we already know there's a Lazarus pit down the road. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I know something that a lot of fans have been asking for that this season continues to move towards. And uh, it bothers me, I think, a little less than a lot of the fans. But I also understand where they're coming from is that Beast Boy, he pretty much only turns into a tiger. And I think it was last season he did turn into a snake, but it was when he was like mind controlled. And then this season he turns into a bat. So he's learning to do other things, but I think that's part of his arc. So instead of him just being able to automatically turn into whatever he wants, whenever he wants, he's sort of learning that. Um, But I like that at least they did deliver on that in this one. I like when he became the bat and it was more of an instinctual thing and he helped guide whatever it was. I don't know if it was Nightwing's body or whatever to the Lazarus pit. So I like that Gar continues to, to gain his abilities as we go. That that's a fine arc, and it and it makes sense for somebody with superpowers that they don't necessarily have a full grasp on to gradually develop and and gain control and understanding of them. I think just maybe a little bit further down on the accelerator with that idea. Yeah, no, I I do agree with that. Like every couple episodes, yeah. have him get near an animal and just you know a little bit of a shift, and and him gradually beginning to understand that he can do more than that i mean yeah yeah, it's just three seasons in he should have been more than three things by now is is my my own personal stance on yeah i i agree with that i like that they are moving in that direction but i agree that yeah we're we've already gone three seasons down it's still in progress like at this point it shouldn't still be in progress or at least as it, it should be further along than it is yeah so uh I, I guess I'm shocked we haven't addressed this already, but uh, Tim Drake. Yeah. Well, you're you're the the biggest Tim Drake fan I know. You're the biggest proponent of that character and have been since I've known you. Uh, I personally I like Drake in this. I, mm-hmm. I think they they made some changes here and there, which you know is fine with a show like this, especially where you got to treat it like an Elseworlds from main comic continuity or whatnot. But for the most part, I personally feel like they did Drake quite a bit of justice. I, I think there might have been one or two things more that we could have gotten with him to to further him down the path of being Robin. But, you know, they, they weren't rushing it, but they were definitely indicating that, that you know, he's probably going to be a long-term character for the show, which is fine with me because I liked him. I, I think it was... Uh, I think most of the choices made for him were, were pretty good, but I'm definitely interested in hearing what you have to say about it. So... First of all, I will say I'm impressed that we've got Tim Drake. Uh, when the show started and Dick was still Robin when the show started, I was like, oh, we'll never get to Tim Drake. It's going to take, there's so much that has to happen before we can get there. Um, and I had already accepted that. But then the fact that we had Jason Todd in season one, I was like, oh, that's great that we've already got him out there. And the fact that they wanted to do the Red Hood. So I do love that they managed to find a way to bring in Tim. Um, within the timeline of this series in a way that makes some sense. Um, I I think it's good that they didn't rush him putting on a Robin outfit in the season. The fan in me, of course, wants to see it. But I also think that, yeah, it's still probably too early and he really doesn't have any training yet. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense within the context of the story for him to be Robin yet. But what I did like, number one, I like the actor a lot. I think he's really good. Um, I don't fully think that like he's to me, he's not exactly like off the page, Tim Drake, but that's okay. Um, the way I do feel like Jason Todd feels like he's just off the page. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily see that for Tim, but I do like the actor. He has an earnestness about him that's very Tim Drake that I like. And to your point, what I like is they took the core of who Tim Drake is and how he enters this world. They did take that from the comics, and it's pretty faithful. Um, But then, of course, you have to change details because of what's going on in this show. So I thought there was really smart writing as far as that goes, where... Uh, you know, in the comics, he was obsessed with Batman and Robin. He figured out who they were, and that's his entry point: is him trying to bring them back together. And here, he 
he is a big fan of Batman and Robin, but also the Titans. And he's figured out who the Titans are. And so he still seeks out Nightwing to try and help the same way he does in the comics. But it's just a little different because of, of the fact that Batman is MIA. Uh, he's not really part of the story. They, you know, they keep finding excuses to remove Batman, which I get. Uh, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was cool in that it was shockingly faithful, but still fit into to what was happening with Titans. So I like him a lot when he, you know, I like the friendship that he and Donna have. I think that was really cool. I like how, again, he has this innate want to do good, to be heroic, to be a part of it, um, which all is very faithful to who Tim, Tim Drake is. And so I like how it ends with the promise of he's still going with them. You know, it is coming. But when he starts with, I want to be the next Robin, uh, they could have rushed it. And they could have been like, oh, okay, great. We got another Robin. But I like that they held back because it would have been pretty irresponsible to make him Robin at that point. Yeah, it's like hand him the uniform. Here, try this on. Great. Yeah, good luck to you. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're pretty much on the same page with that. I was just curious your perspective because you are, I mean, I like Drake. He's, he's my second favorite Robin behind Kerry Kelly. But, you know, I, I know what a big fan you are. For me, I think they did about as good of a job as you could have asked them to do in fitting him for the mold of what this show is. Yeah. So I, I think yeah. you and I are, are kind of on that page together too. So Yeah, I agree. I, I liked him a lot, and I'm excited for more of him. I know he's excited too. Uh because he's he's very vocal on Twitter. He he loves that he he got this role, and it's it's great to see that enthusiasm. So, looking forward to seeing more of him. But yeah, I I actually do appreciate the restraint they showed with him, because you've already got Nightwing, you've got Red Hood. It, it would have felt rushed to make him Robin too quickly. I do like how he delivered the the kick at that one moment, and they're like, "How'd you learn to do that?" And he's like, "YouTube." Yeah. Right. <laughs> But you can't be Robin just based on YouTube. No, no, no. Well, I mean, you probably could, but it'd take more than that. Yeah. Was it? I think it was this. I, I did love that the season was in Gotham. Again, I thought Barbara Gordon was terrific. Uh, she was amazing. Uh, great casting. Really good chemistry with Dick. I liked that strained relationship where they, they still love each other. They still trust each other, but they have to keep each other at arm's length. Um, I thought all that was was really good. Um, and I liked, again, I liked the Gotham of it all. I'm a sucker for that, obviously. I have a Batman podcast. Um, and Wayne Manor and the Batcave. But it was this season, again, this was going back a while, but it was this season where uh, we get the nod to like the T-Rex in the Batcave, right? But it's like a hologram version. Yes. So there was like really fun Easter eggs in Gotham, especially in the Batcave, uh, that I, you know, as a big nerd, I was just like, oh, that's great. I love they did that. I love they did that. Like you said, the trophy case uh, where, man, what a missed opportunity to not have Jonathan Crane raid the trophy case and use all of that stuff against Gotham. But still, I liked that it was there. I thought it was cool. I agree. You know, um, most of those, the set designs and costume designs, again, I, I mad props to the, the people that do the show. You can tell they're fans because they're, they're making things look as faithful as they do in almost every case. It's just the, the choices that they make to put some of that in action. I, I have to scratch my head at. Yeah. Uh, something else I wanted to bring up. We talked about it a little bit, but we talked about how good Jason Todd is in this. And like I said, I do think that he is. The performance is great. Curran Walters uh, did a great job with Jason Todd since season one. Um, I think he's great in this season as well. But there Looks is... like him, moves like him, acts like him. Everything about him, I think, is, is pretty well spot on. Yes, yeah. But there's a whole episode that essentially shows the backstory of what led to his death in episode one. Mm -hmm. And that episode, I thought, was the real standout of the season. It was really great. Curran Walters gives an amazing performance in that episode. And what I also liked about it was it really showed how much Bruce cares for Jason. And we talked about this in the last episode is like, I, I get the a hole Bruce. I get it, but I, I don't like too much of it. I like a Bruce that shows that he still cares about the bat family and his allies and, and his friends. And um, I loved that episode because 
from Jason's point of view, it was like Bruce turned his back on him and that's why he rebelled. But then when you actually see what happens, it's like that's not the way it went down. That's just the way, uh, you know, a cocky a dumb teenage little, kid. Would yeah, exactly. A cocky little kid like Jason sees it, but he doesn't understand that Bruce is it's tough love. Right. He's trying to do what's best for Jason, even if it's not what Jason wants. Um, and. There's just a really great scene between Ian Glenn and Curran Walters where they have that conversation where he's like, you can't be Robin anymore. It's too dangerous, but you will always be my son and I don't want you to go anywhere. Um, it was really good. Like, And I remember watching that episode going, oh man, the season's killing it. And that was before things got a little dodgy in the second half. Yeah, I, I concur with that 100%. That was part of that me saying those that first few episodes had me saying that this was the best the show had ever been that that was certainly a contributing factor to me thinking that right yeah that was that was really good so when we get stuff like that and especially when it's focused on bruce and dick and jason you know these characters that i love uh when it's when it's firmly set in the batman world that's why i like i can't just dismiss the show out of hand because you you give me these great representations of great beats between these characters i'm like see it's it's not all bad. <laughs> no, it's it's not. And even though I may be critical of most of the back half of the season and saying that it progressively degenerated for me, there's still things to like in there. It's not I'm not like rage hating the entire thing. That's that's not what where I'm at with it. It's just mostly for me it's disappointment. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's it is it's the disappointment of us going, y- you're so close. You're so close to just nailing this thing. And yet you keep tripping yourself up. Why? <laughs> Come on, guys. Like, it's not that hard. And I think that's it's more frustrating when there's so much good about it, but they can't quite get to great as opposed to something that's just garbage to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wonder how much of this I can blame on the Nolan factor, too. And I know I blame him for a lot, which is weird because I love those movies so much and love him as a filmmaker. But, you know, there's so much conflict and darkness and and everything going on in those films. And I feel like so many people have emulated that tone, especially for the Batman character since then. I just I don't know. I, I question how much of that Dark Knight trilogy effect has played down on this show where they, they think they're giving people what they want. But in actuality, some people out there, and I can't speak for everybody, I can speak for myself, have had just about enough of that and want something just a little bit different now. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand this is a darker and more mature show, but even some of the mature aspects of this show, I really feel like they're they're doing it just because they can't. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm not a prudish person. It, language and that so, violence, that, that sort of thing just... It doesn't offend me, but sometimes I just have to look at it and go, why? No, I, I and, completely th- th- agree. Yeah. There's, a, there's a scene in this in this season, and, you know, when, when the season started, you know, uh, Dick saying F Batman, that was kind of a big deal. Yeah. But they still seemed in those, the early on uh, in, in the show's starting out, it, there was more restraint to that sort of thing. And then it felt like they just kept pushing boundaries to to settle into a comfort with doing it with these characters. And I just like, why? Why? But there's there's a scene in this season where Jason has that guilt over Hawk. So he goes to this place where these people are doing like a sex cam show. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, why? Why is this here? This does not. There was no resolution that came out of that other than him unloading a guilty conscience. But. I mean, you you could have done that in any number of ways, but the one that they chose, except they chose to do it that way because they could. Yeah. It made no sense. Yeah, I forgot about that, but yeah, that's true. I mean, and especially because this show, it takes very little to make it a PG-13 show. Mm-hmm. You just drop the F-bombs, really, and you know a couple of little moments like that, and the story doesn't change at all. The show doesn't change at all, um, but you just are then accessible to a larger audience. So I always thought it was a weird choice to go, we're doing an R-rated Titans. What's the need? Um, 
So yeah, no, that's, I mean, I, I do agree with that. Uh, I will say the other thing I want to talk about, uh, it was Blackfire. I mentioned it a little bit in the spoiler free section. Um, I do like her a lot. Uh, as far as the actress goes, um, I like how she she's, looks. She's breathtaking. She's yeah. absolutely breathtaking. Oh, she's beautiful. Yeah. But, she looks great. And, and nothing, nothing wrong with her performance. Just that character just doesn't do a damn thing for me. Well, and, and again, I think that's why is they sort of, they sort of cut off her legs as soon as she shows up and that, isn't as fun so i thought it was interesting that like she comes in hot right and she immediately gets put in this containment chamber by argus or whatever and um like i like when starfire seeks her out and uh realizes what's going on and they have a good fight and everything and and starfire's like well i'm gonna leave he- i'm leaving you here you can't be trusted and then she realizes oh i just doomed my sister good or bad to like a lifetime of uh incarceration and i i can't do that and so i thought there was some like really good stuff there but i don't know like they they do it a little bit where where it's like can we trust blackfire can we she becomes sort of a a a titan but half in half out um but i think it would have been a lot more interesting if she really had been a little more villainous she is a villain in in the comics um because as it is, it's sort of half baked and, you know, she and Connor get together, which I fine, I'm indifferent to that. But I just feel like there was a lot more to be mined from that. Um, and the one moment I think that it was it did, does pay off is there's a moment where she takes Starfire's powers and you're like, oh, did she do this on purpose? Was this always her plan or did she literally just do it because she had to? Um, that was, I thought, a nice moment. But yeah, I just felt like there was a lot left on the table with Blackfire that could have been a lot more interesting, a lot more exciting, but they just weren't as interested in her. And I thought that that was a missed opportunity. Fair enough. I mean, even, even the stuff with Starfire and, and you know, I, I much have the same opinion about this actress that I do about the Blackfire actress. She's beautiful. She turns in a fine performance. I, I like most of what I see from her, but I mean, these these visions, the flashbacks to the Tamaranian royal family talking about, well, she doesn't have this particular ability, so she can't be a member of the royal family or assume the crown. It's like none of that interests me. And maybe it's just because, I mean, I, I can probably count on both hands and feet the number of Starfire comics that I've read or comics with her in it. And I have no opposition to her character. I don't have any issue there, I just I, I'm simply not interested in these flashbacks about the the Tamaranian royal family, the visions with the baby, her having these random blackout sleepwalk sessions. I mean, none of that appeals to me at all. No, at the I, I agree with you at the beginning, like when she was having the flashbacks and sleepwalking and all that, I was like, oh God, I don't need to see a season of this. And fortunately, it ended as soon as they found Blackfire, and I was glad about that um, because yeah, that I was like, oh, this is gonna get old quick, but. I still think there was there was something to the the Blackfire Starfire story that I feel like didn't fully get explored Um, because I I thought the backstory was interesting in that they Blackfire's powers were stolen from her uh, and she didn't have a choice in the matter. And that's why she's so angry. I think there's something to that. But again, to my point, she is a big Titans villain. And so for them to go, ah, they they worked it out. Now she's now she's just a part of the team and wants to go home and you're like okay sure uh, it just isn't yeah there's just not a lot there um, I mean I was a little taken aback when Connor realized oh she's leaving me and so he destroyed her ship <laughs> I was like damn boy talk that about was, possessive yeah. yeah and then only to rebuild it at the end no less or or start the plans to rebuild it I should, yeah I should yeah i also say maybe this is controversial but i i liked the moment when dick used the kryptonite dust on connor and the dog crypto yeah because to me that's such a batman move yeah of like i don't want to hurt you i'm not gonna hurt you it's not gonna kill you but i just you're you're not you know i just need you out of the way like I was like, damn! Like to me, that was that was Dick channeling Batman. I agree with that. So what else haven't we? I can't remember, but 
we talked about a little bit is that like they use the Lazarus pit a lot, which is fine. Um, oh, that that's what I was going to bring up was the, the purple rain episode, the, the ending and how that was handled. So I thought that was kind of clever to be like, Hey, how do we, how do we reverse what the scarecrow has done? Um, but I guess my question is because they did that is the Lazarus pit now gone because of that. Well, isn't there more than one Lazarus pit? Well, sure. Maybe I not just, on the one location. in Gotham, though. Like, did that use up yeah. the one in Gotham? I can't remember. I I would think so. But I would too. I yeah. I don't know because at that point I was laughing for all of the wrong reasons, and I had already fully checked out on the season. So honestly, I I wasn't paying attention if they did cover that base or not. Because in concept, yes, that's that's a a, a good enough idea. But just the way it looked and the way it was handled and the fact that all of a sudden, you know, the Lazarus pits aren't an instantaneous thing where you, you know, dunk and you're resurrected, but like all of a sudden this, a raindrop hits somebody up on the ground and they're, they're up and going, huh, what, what happened? I just, I, I don't know. I, I just couldn't go on that ride. I, well, I was... They also, you know, the Lazarus pit in the comics, especially like in order to avoid what this season does in order to avoid it being this catch all, you can always use it to bring someone back. There is a price to be paid. And this was something that arrow actually did very well is like, yes, there's a Lazarus pit, but that doesn't necessarily mean you get back who you put in. Um, well, the the thing with the Lazarus pit for me and in, in most of the stuff that I've read is the madness that sets it. Exactly. Especially, That's what, yeah. Especially if it's used more than once. Right. That's what I'm getting at is, is, it, it's this madness and sometimes the person can get over it and come back, but so a lot of times they can't. Um, and Arrow really hammered that home when they used the Lazarus pit. They did it with, with Ollie. They did it with uh, White Canary. And to the point where like there was like a really long thing with just trying to get White Canary back. Um, but here, this that doesn't really seem to be an issue. Like <laughs> you can just drop anyone in at any time whenever you want. Um, and... There doesn't really seem to be any ill side effects, which is, I guess, what allows them to then uh, shower it over all of Gotham. I also thought, oh, well, this is going to suck for anybody who's indoors today. They're still screwed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I just was like, yeah, I was they'll like, have super soakers filled with the Lazarus pit stuff to go in the buildings and handle that later. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, I just was like, man, like <clears throat> if the Lazarus pit has no negative uh, side effects, then yeah, like what the hell not? Although I feel like in this one they imply that <laughs> to, to to steal from the Princess Bride, you only have to you have to be mostly dead for it to bring you back. To blade. If you're if you're all dead, it won't bring you back because I feel like when they put Dick in it, they're like it might be too late. He might be too far gone. Mm. Am, I, am I remembering that correctly? I don't I, remember. I, I don't. I don't remember that. But again, I was folding a lot of laundry and such by this point, so. <laughs> You're like, you're like, yeah, I don't know about that, but I do know that I was able to find all of my socks and there were no stray one-offs. That is the most annoying thing in the world. I can't stand that. Where do they go? What do they do? It's like a secret society of missing socks, runaways. Yeah. Anyway. So, all right. Well, and then, yeah, where where they do leave it is, yeah, they they managed to save, I guess, anyone who's outdoors in Gotham. Uh, through the Lazarus pit. But yeah, I, I did take it to mean that, okay, now that that Lazarus pit is kaput, which I think is good, you kind of have to eliminate it because then it becomes too easy to go, well, we've always got this. We always got this get out of death free card that we can use. Um, and then, yeah, they're all going to head back to San Francisco, but they're going to do a road trip. Maybe that's season four. Season four is just their road trip. It's a se- it's essentially National Lampoon's vacation, but with the Titans. What do you say? It was a 44 hour drive. Yeah. They pick up Ann Edna. (laughs) I guess that could be a season. I don't know (laughs) if it's the season I want. How about starting it where the RVs rolling into San Francisco in season one episode or season four, episode one. Yeah, maybe, but yeah. And they bring Tim with them. Um, I can't remember. I feel like they leave Donna behind. Donna's going to go do her own thing. I think. Yeah. It's Donna's another one of those things that, I, I don't mind the the actress good, you know, having that power set character around good, you know, the the Wonder Woman representation, what have you. I just choices made with that character simply do not sit well with me, and that's not just a this season exclusive with her. Mm-hmm. 
electrified on a electric. Well, that's house. yes. I mean, that was <laughs> that, that, that was real bad. Uh, I, I did like seeing her use the the lasso. You know, it's you know very much like what you see with the uh, the Wonder Woman films. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Well, anything else you want to hit on before we we wrap up? It's, uh, it's thirteen episodes, so we're of course not going to cover everything, but. I, if I'm being petty and nitpicky, I do have to ask how the actor playing Jonathan Crane puts on suits that are tailored to fit. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher his name, but Ian Glenn. Mm-hmm. Those two are not the same size. Uh, <laughs> okay. But that's petty. That's that's nitpicky. Maybe Bruce Wayne just has like fat pants in his closet for when he's suppressed. When he turns into the Hulk or what? No, for, you know, during the holidays when he's eating too much. Mm. I guess. Oh, wait a second. Well, there, there was a character in this. Was that basically like the new Alfred? I forget his name, but like a younger guy that was like Bruce's driver, butler, that sort of stuff. Oh, geez. I don't even remember. It doesn't even stand out. Yeah. That's how important he was in this series. But anyway, I, I think I've hit on all the, the stuff that I wanted to mention. I mean, it's... <sighs> The, the, the mixed bag for me this season, especially leaned way more on the disappointing side than the pleasantly pleased side. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't you give some closing thoughts and we'll move on with our Sunday. <laughs> I, I don't know what else I can say than what I just did, but uh, here, here's hoping I, I'll, I'll go with season four, but I'm not going to be looking forward to season four the way I was looking forward to season three or two or any of that other stuff. Now I'm, just going to kind of go into it with lowered expectations and hope I come out surprised with it. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, there was a lot that I liked, but unfortunately there was a lot I was disappointed with. And as I said, I think the most disappointing thing is we all can see, Oh, this would have worked better if you had just done this a little differently. And so it doesn't even feel like it's, it doesn't need like a hundred percent or 180 degree turnaround. You just need to nudge it this way or that. And I think you got a really great Titans show, but uh, the, the showrunners just see, they're so bound and determined to just go. And then Bruce Wayne tries to kill himself. Didn't see that coming. Did ya? And then this well, one I, dies. I, and then this one dies. And then this I, one dies. I also have to ask how much interference is coming from higher ups that maybe are not there that are above the showrunner level. Because, you know, so far we've we've had the end of season one became the beginning of season two. Why did that happen? I don't know if we ever really got a story about that, but evidently there were some pretty significant changes that went on there. Mm-hmm. Why? Why are these changes happening? Are there changes being forced on the show in the middle of these story arcs mid-season? I mean, we we simply don't know. Hmm. I guess. But I, I, ha- I have to wonder at this point. I mean, there's there's a lot of really wonky stuff going on where I have to wonder if it's really the fault of the writers or if they've got something set in there that the, the suit above them is like, nah, let's try this. I mean, maybe. I don't know. It just... It just feels like we should be so far past stuff like that. You know, like I, what you said, does it made me think, oh, did you know, was there a rule like Jonathan? You can use Jonathan Crane, but he can't go full scarecrow because we got plans for that. But it's like, why? When? Like, come on. Like you were able to have full on Deathstroke in season two. Who cares? Just, you know, just everyone should be able to play and, with and, all the and toys. At the, po- at the point that they they were making season two. Number one, I don't think the the whole Legion of Doom thing was dead in the water just yet. Mm-hmm. And there was also a strong consideration of making a Deathstroke solo movie with the guy that did those raid movies. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no reason in the world not to use a full bore scarecrow with that. Yeah, no, I agree. So I, I don't know if that was whose decision that was, if it truly was a creative decision by the showrunners or if it was an edict that was passed down of like, no, you can't do that. Which, But again, I feel like we should be so far past that. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, I still like it. Call me a sucker maybe, but, uh, I, I still think there is a lot to like about it. I just, I just wish they wouldn't, like I said, keep getting in their own way. And I think that's the biggest problem is they're just bound and determined to push the envelope and, and be edgy for edgy sake. And it's like, actually, you just take one little step backwards and you're going to end up with a much stronger show. You've got yeah. 
you know, you've got an amazing cast of Titans and even villains. Um, you know, use them a little better. But they did get picked up for season four. So season four is coming. We know nothing about it yet, but, you know, hope springs eternal <laughs> like the Lazarus pit and we'll hope for the best and see what happens. My guess is it'll be a lot like this is we'll go, oh, look, because I feel like season two and season three both have the same thing as uh, it started and we're like, oh, man, they rebounded. They learned the, they learned from their mistakes. And somewhere halfway through the season, it's like, oh, no, never mind. They're making all new ones. So, I, I'm hoping that's not the case, but again, it, it, it's a very guarded optimism that I've got going into season four. So yeah, yep. Well, we'll be there whenever the time comes. Um, but we're gonna move on. Like I said, uh, we did watch another episode of Batman Beyond. But before we talk about that, I want to give another shout out to Manscaped, who uh, are sponsoring the show. So uh, give Manscaped a try. It is still the holiday season. Treat yourself or treat your significant other or loved ones to uh, the gift of a little bit of trimming and a little bit of hygiene. Uh, As I said on the last episode, I I already used the products, and so I can certainly tell you from experience, they're great. Uh, They're definitely worth it. It's the nicest trimmer you'll ever buy, and then they have all kinds of other cool stuff. So give Manscaped a try. We would certainly appreciate it if you haven't already. Uh, And make sure you use the promo code BATSCAPED, B-A-T-S-C-A-P-E-D, BATSCAPED, uh, so that way they know that you found them through us because that then helps the show. So there are many ways to support the show, but this is another way to support the show and also do something for yourself or, again, for your loved ones, your significant other, or significant others. Uh, I'm not here to judge. It's the Christmas season. Spread the love. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, Manscaped, the, the products are great. Uh, definitely worth it. And you save 20% by using Batscaped. So give it a shot. And uh, yeah, if you, or give it as a gift this Christmas season. Just not to I, like your grandpa or something. That makes it weird. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I've, I've started dipping in and using some of the... Uh, stuff that was sent to me and th- these are high quality products a I, I special shout out to the light on the trimmer that's a very nice touch i know right it, sometimes yeah. shadows and the lights that are over your head while you're trying to handle some business they they get in the way of things and that's where accidents can happen and it's nice having that extra light on there so that uh you don't lose sight of the uh task at hand <laughs> right yeah. Weed Whacker, very high quality product. I mean, I've got the uh, whole ear and nose thing happening because I started becoming an old man when I was probably in my late teens or early 20s. So that is a very nice item as opposed to the one that I was using before that was more of the uh, the wand design where the blade's only on one side. This is a 360 design on it. Very nice, very easy to use and does its job very well. So yeah, I, I'm enjoying what was sent to me so far. Yeah. It's all good stuff, truly. Uh, and, uh, oh God, what was I going to say? Oh, well, I forgot. That's fine. <laughs> it'll, it'll come back to me. Um, but yeah, good stuff, good quality stuff. Um, I love the little charging station and everything. Like, again, just makes it nice and sleek and cool and easy to use. So definitely worth it. Again, manscaped.com. For 20% off, get Batscaped right now, or I think well, I think it might have ended by now, but they were having like the Black Friday, they were giving 20% anyway, but even so, still use Batscaped, so again, uh, they know that we sent you. So go give that a, a, a try, uh, we would appreciate it, and in the end, I think you will appreciate it too. So, cool. Thanks guys. Um, now, let's uh, take a look at the next episode of Batman Beyond. All right, so last time we discussed the episode Payback. Uh, We're still on Season 2, but we are at the end of Season 2. We're so close. Uh, This is Season 2, Episode 25, Where's Terry? It was directed by Yukio Suzuki, written by Rich Fogel, and this one aired on May 27th of 2000. Uh, This one starts with Terry and uh, Dana going out on, well, not really a double date, because going out on a friend date. Also with uh, Max and their other friend, 
whose name escapes me. It's not that important. Ster- stereotypical overweight nerd guy. The big nerd, yeah. Which who we have seen before, right? Um, yeah. So I was like that a, at least a design that was just like him anyway. Yeah. Recycled design. Yeah. I, was it Howard? Maybe something like that. I don't. Um, he, I, he was very integral and important to the whole continuity. So I made sure I committed all of his stuff to my brain. Well, guess what? Be on the lookout because you're getting an action figure of that character for Christmas. Great. Yep. You can cherish that forever. Uh, anyway, I, I do like the continuity of when old characters like that just show up for, for a scene or two and just makes the world feel, uh, you know, consistent, which I like, but anyway, they go to the movies, uh, Dana, because it's all she does. She guilt trips Terry, even though they're out on a date. She guilt trips him that like, isn't it nice to go on a date at night for once? Um, which is so she funny. she's the best girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> I know. Uh, and he's like, hey, man, I get it. But anyway, got to go. So he goes. He sees uh, some a suspicious character in the subway. He follows. And then we cut to the next day. The next day, Terry never came home that night. He's not in school. Nobody knows where he is. Bruce doesn't know where he is. Dana, Max, uh, his mom, his brother, none of them know where Terry is. Hence why this is Where's Terry? Um, So they all start trying to figure out where he might have gone off to, uh, especially Bruce. Bruce seeks... uh, seeks him out and ends up teaming up with Max. They connect and uh, he tries to tell Max to stay home, don't get involved, but Max is like, no, I've helped you before. I'm going to help you again. We're going to find Terry. Turns out Terry, uh, he was down there in the subway. He, there was a cave in. He ended up getting knocked out, I guess for many, many hours. He wakes up. He ends up meeting this little kid named Dak, who also lives down there. He's like a runaway. Uh, and we find out that also down there is Shriek and his little minion, who I don't know his name either. Sorry. But he's voiced by Michael Rosenbaum. Um, but Shriek and his little minion have been using this as a secret hideaway. And that's who Terry saw. So he was going and Shriek thought he had killed Batman turns out he hadn't and so now he's off to find him again he ends up trapping Terry and the little kid uh, with another seismic vibration and we find out yeah this little kid just wants to do what he wants he's happy being a runaway Uh, he said you know some of the kids want to be you but not me I'd rather be like a blight or someone like that because they get to do whatever they want so Terry manages to uh, make a big enough hole to escape, but only for the kids. So he sets the kid free. The kid gets captured by Shriek. uh, And they're trying to find out where Batman is. At the same time, Bruce and Max are exploring. They see uh, a gang member with Terry's backpack. So they go and Bruce gets some information from him against his his will uh, about where he got the backpack. So they realize that Terry is somewhere down in the subway uh bruce sets up max and is like okay i'll distract them and you go find terry and uh and then he immediately is like hey what's that what's that girl doing over there and the cops are not is it cops i don't know if it's cops or construction workers they're like hey you can't be down there which allows bruce to go find terry uh and so they find terry they bring down shriek uh and then you know terry goes home his mom realized, thinks that nothing ever happened, that he was just starting to make his bed. He was just got in late, left early. Uh, but Max and Bruce were able to work together, and uh, Max continues to be a useful ally here uh, to this version of Batman. So uh, what would you think of Where's Terry? Well, over the course of the whatever amount of time it is we've spent doing these uh, Batman Beyond reviews, uh, I've, I've at least come to the a point where I realized that there's something I can find a like in just about any episode, even the episodes that I may not necessarily be into. Uh, This was not that episode. Oh, wow. About the only nice thing I can say about this episode is I like seeing Max because as far as this show is concerned, she's really one of my, my favorite characters in it. So Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really thought this was a bland flat episode with not a lot to offer, at least for my sensibilities. And, uh, I don't want to spend all day beating a dead horse, but I, I was not a fan of this one at all. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I, I liked it. I thought it was all right. Um, I, I mean, I get what you're saying. It Well, in some ways, like my biggest problem with it is that 
We don't even know if Shriek is up to no good. He's just kind of hanging out down in the subway. So for all we know, it's just because he can't afford an apartment. Like, he, there's no greater plan. He's not trying to do anything bad. That's just where he is. Um, so I just was like, I mean, shouldn't we be stopping him from doing something bad? He's just kind of there, but that seems like sin enough. Um, but I like the idea of like Terry goes missing and then Bruce and Max having to team up. I think that's actually a really cool story. I like that Bruce got, goes out there and he gets in the field. I agree with you. It's been a while since we've had a good Max episode. Uh, and so it was nice to see her back because she is a great character. Um, what I thought was interesting is I feel like this show has teased us multiple times with the possibility of getting a Robin. And it felt like they were doing that with Dak, the kid, again, where it was like, this kid kind of looks like a Robin. Uh, He meets Batman. He's a runaway. uh, He's a little troubled. But he... We find out he's a pretty good kid by the end. Uh, I was like, oh, like, were they just hadn't decided who was going to be Robin yet because I feel like they did that with Terry's brother. Uh, In some ways they did it with Max and then they do it with this kid where I'm like, they were just sort of setting up possibilities to maybe have a Robin and just never got there. Um, But that was what I thought with this, this random new character of Dak. I just was like, Oh, were they going, Oh, maybe this can be our Robin eventually. But I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, he certainly fits the bill of the Jason Todd of the future and that he's an annoying little shit that I don't really want around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he is in this one. Uh, so I, I like the moment where when Batman, he makes the opening and uh, he says, oh, you you can fit through, but I can't, which I'm like, it looks big enough that he could fit through. But OK, we'll just kind of chalk that up to the way it was drawn. Um, and Dak is like, really? He goes, yeah, you know, there's no reason for both of us to to you know if one of us can escape it's better than neither of us so like there's some nice moments there and also shriek i kind of forgot about him so it's been a while since we've gotten some of the batman beyond rogues we've gotten a lot of one-offs and stuff so it was nice to see the return of a villain even though again we don't even know what he's up to so i liked it well enough um I, i vaguely remember shriek i don't remember at all this morlock looking dude that's rolling around with him was that part of his Oh my God, he looks familiar. So I do feel like we've seen him before, but I, I couldn't tell you where. Yeah, I, I wish I was invested enough to the show to remember that, but I really don't. So. Yeah, me either. So and like I yeah I don't know if he was tied to Shriek in the past, but I've certainly I recognize the character for one reason or another. So I don't know. I thought I kind of liked it. It wasn't the best one ever, but. I thought it was it was good enough, and I I did like the way that Bruce tricked Max. <laughs> I thought that was pretty great. Of like, hey, should that girl be over there? Um, that was pretty funny to me. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Then uh, what is? I'm, the- I'm glad I'm glad you got something out of it because I I really got nothing out of this one. All and right. Well then, maybe maybe it's on me because I transitioned right from the last three or four episodes of Titans that I crammed in yesterday right to this. So I was already kind of in a uh, kind of a cranky. So yeah, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll chalk some of that up to that and I'll give it the benefit of the doubt when I drop the grade on it here in a minute too. So, <laughs> okay, well go ahead, drop the grade D plus. Oh man. And All that's, right. that's mostly because I'm, I'm giving it that benefit of the doubt and because Max was in the episode. Okay. Wow, I this is a big gap because I like this one. I mean, again, I didn't love it, but I liked it. I was going to give it like a B. You're so generous and kind. Well, and maybe you were just cranky because of Titans. And, and maybe the other thing is this last episode that we talked about, and, and I didn't think it was the greatest, but at least it sparked some conversation and the, the ideas and potentials of that, that episode were were there and, and made for a nice discussion. And this one, I, I can't even offer that much up. So mm, yeah, no, that's yeah. true. Well, and I think that's just it. It's like, it's, it's pretty surface level. There's not, you know, it doesn't go deep, but again, I appreciated the premise. It's kind of an interesting premise of Batman goes missing or this version of Batman goes missing. And uh, now the people left behind have to figure out where he was. I honestly think it might've been better if we didn't check in on Terry so soon, like if they had let us wonder what happened to him too, and we discovered it when Bruce and Max did, that would have, I think might've been more interesting. You know, you know what would have made this episode for me is Terry goes missing. They can't find him. We don't check in. We don't know where he was at. Bruce puts on like some giant ass bat mech armor and goes through the streets hunting for him and realizes, Hey, I don't need Terry for any of this shit. I'm going to be Batman again. 
The end. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, I'm sure that, yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> okay. You said a D plus? Yeah. Okay. D plus and a B for Where's Terry? Big gap there. Um, but the next... Let it never be said you and I are of the same mind. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, next one up is Ace in the Hole. That sounds like a Royal Flush Gang episode. Oh, but who else is named Ace? Oh, they have the dog, I guess. Yeah, we could have a dog. Yeah. I, I'd appreciate a dog episode. Yeah. Especially a smart dog instead of the two idiots I have living in my house. <laughs> uh, well, this one, Ace in the Hole, it's going to be the last episode of season two. Wow. So we got to keep right on it. Moving right along. Moving right along. Uh, all right. Well, there you go. Keep following along, guys. We are in the home stretch, um, but we're not going to say goodbye just yet because last time we had to skip the Wayne Manor mailbox, so we got some emails to catch up on. So uh, let's do that. Let's check in with you fine feathered finks as we crack open the Wayne Manor mailbox. You've got mail. Derek. Speaking of fine feathered finks, did you see the news that Colin Farrell is officially signed to do the Penguin HBO Max series? Uh, you have no idea how big my smile was for that. That's and great. Again, th- th- this is not based off of the character so much as I'm a Colin Farrell fan. So any content I can get with him, especially in like a Batman universe capacity, hell yes, throw it at me. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I was like, that that makes that project so much more exciting. I love that he signed on to it. I can't wait. I think that's awesome. And that makes it less of a i mean we knew it was set in that universe but i mean you can really have a detached continuity in a universe as we learned over the years that really solidifies the the attachment to it there yeah yeah so i mean yeah i mean you've got the batman movie and then you're gonna have this gordon spinoff this gordon gotham pd spinoff and you're gonna have a penguin spinoff like they're really fleshing out the universe that's cool oh wait he's I, I guess I didn't read the whole thing so much as just the headline, which I'm prone to do these days because I don't like giving clicks where I don't need to. Uh, he's not part of the Gordon show. He's actually having his own show. Yeah. Oh. Two separate projects. Oh. Curious. Yeah. So that's a cool. I just assumed he was part of the Gordon show. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Let's move forward here. This is from our pal Weston Craig. It says, what are people's thoughts on Doom Patrol season three? I've watched it all. I thought it was good, but not as good as the first two seasons. Um, I still have a couple episodes to go. I'm really close to the end, uh, but I'm I'm loving it. I, I It's certainly different than the first two seasons, but season two is different than season one. Uh, I still think it's great. It's just a little different, but... Michelle Gomez is awesome. I, I love her. Uh, there's some really interesting things happening. I think I talked on the last episode about that great, uh, the great episode where they all have to face themselves. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in Doom Patrol. It's, it never disappoints me. Jamie? I actually am still not all the way through season two yesterday. In fact, yesterday after I got done watching Titans and Batman Beyond, I watched the space patrol episode of season two. And I, I still enjoy the show. It's just, I keep getting sidetracked from it for some reason. And yesterday, I think I finally put my finger on it like more. I've I've had my suspicions about it, but I can't stand Niles's daughter. Mm. I don't like her at all. Nothing about her. So I, I have a hard time rolling with, but you know, of course, the stuff with Jane is interesting to me. And of course, you know, robot and even the little side thing with uh, cyborg and, and his girl, uh, of course, Larry and, and Rita. I mean, all, all of them work great for me, but like Niles, daughter, it's just like anytime she's on screen, it's like, I want to be doing anything else. Well, then you'll like season three. Cool. She kind of pieces out on, I think the first episode and we haven't seen her since. Good. Uh, this one's very Rita heavy this season, which is okay. I think she's amazing. Ape, April Wolby is she? She's a so fun good. actress. She's in that uh, Father Christmas is Back movie on Netflix this year with uh, Kelsey Grammer and uh, uh, Liz Hurley. Oh, really? 
And she plays Kelsey Grammer's girlfriend, who's like 30 years younger than him. Mm-hmm. And she's great. She's, yeah, absolutely- she's so good. Like, we talk a lot about how great Brendan Fraser is and how great Jane is. And they are. Everyone's so great in this show. And I feel like sometimes we don't give uh, April Bowlby as much credit as she deserves because she is so great as Rita. And I think that this season really shines the light on her a lot. All right. I'll get caught up on that probably sometime early next year after I get done with, you know, I got to get done through cheer Then I got to start getting stuff caught up on stuff I haven't seen for the 2021 movies. And yeah. after that, I'll have some free time, I think. Okay. Um, all right. Next message is from Muhammad. It says, Hey guys, hope you're doing well and enjoying the upcoming winter season, except for you, Brendan, you know why? Cause it's not really winter. I'm assuming. Um, He says, I began my soundtrack listening journey a few years ago. I'm very fond of certain composers. Below is a list of composers that I'm a fan of, and I'd like you guys to pick a DC character for which they would be perfect for composing. Uh, He's got a list. We'll do that in a second. Uh, He says, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Sorry for the long email, so I'll end with a lame joke. Batman knows many languages, yet he is most familiar with the language of pain. Yours truly, Muhammad. Um, okay, so here are the composers. Uh, John Powell, Claus Badel, uh, Jerry Goldsmith, Hans Zimmer, Harry Gregson Williams, James Newton Howard, and Fernando Velasquez. I'll, st- I'll start at the end. Fernando Velasquez, I don't know who that is. I'm not familiar with I don't know that him. one either. Yeah, I'm not familiar with his work. So I, maybe I know, <laughs> maybe I'd look it up and go, oh, he did that. But yeah, by name, I don't know him. Uh, John Powell, when I think of John Powell, I think of the How to Train Your Dragon scores, which are amazing. Oh, those are great, yes. Um, so Something um, sweeping for him. Then. Yeah, yeah. Like a, like a, like a big type of uh, crossover team up type of thing would be ideal for that. You know, mm-hmm. I just, the way that his scores mesh with those dragons soaring through the sky and the, those notes as they pick up something. I mean, I, you could say a justice league, but I mean, maybe a, a, a Titans movie of some capacity or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Um, I was not think- a lot of darkness in his music that I've heard. So something you know, not not like a Batman, maybe maybe even Superman, I guess. Yeah, no, Superman is a great call, actually. I think he'd be awesome at that. Let's say Superman. Okay. Uh, Claus Badelt, he did the first Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, oh, really? Why did I assume Zimmer did all of those? Well, because it's very fuzzy. Okay. So basically what happened was, is they wanted Hans Zimmer to do Pirates, but he was committed to another film at the same time. So he couldn't do Pirates. So what he did was he wrote all of the main themes for Pirates and then handed them off to Claus Badelt, who then took those themes and did the actual score. I see. So the big recognizable themes that you know and love from Pirates, those are Hans Zimmer. Claus Badelt is one of his uh, protégés. And then... Claus used those, fleshed them out, and turned it into the full score for the film. Okay. So his style, I guess we could say, is similar to Zimmer's then? Yeah. I, I it is, that. but it, I, 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 I think of him as very like action-focused. I think he could do something very like high-energy action. I mean, maybe it's because we just mentioned it, but I could see him doing like a Deathstroke score, something like that. Maybe I'm just thinking swords. Since, since you're saying high <laughs> energy, my, my brain immediately goes to the flash. So Yeah, I could see that too. Especially especially with the the He's a Pirate, which is maybe one of the best pieces of movie music ever composed in the history of the world. Um that's the music that always makes me want to speed, so maybe it would work for the flash. Okay. Uh I I know Curse of the Black Pearl quite well. I, I love that movie. It's the only Pirates movie that I, I do truly love. I don't really like any of the other ones that I've seen. Uh, I, I haven't just listened to the score independent of the film, but I, you know, I have the themes in my head, like the main ones that you were talking about there, but the, the stuff by name, first of all, I'm terrible at names of music tracks anyway, even for albums that I own and love. I just know the music when I hear it, you know what I mean? It's just kind of strange thing with me. So I, I, you, you say the name of this track and how great it is. I probably know it if I heard it, but I can't place it just off of that well he's a pirate is the track it's the one that plays over the closing credits of every pirate movie okay the okay yeah yeah that one yeah 
Okay, I know that one. Yes. It's so good. Um, all right, let's say The Flash. Let's say Claus bait out The Flash. Good enough. Okay. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith. Classic. Give me some examples. I certainly know the name. I recognize him as a, a good composer, but I need help here. Because sometimes, like him and and uh, Silvestri and some of those other guys, they just kind of blend together for me. And I know that's shameful for somebody that claims to like scores. But if you if you say some of the stuff he's done, I'll be like, oh, yeah, that. Oh, yeah. he. Uh, I mean, Goldsmith has done so much iconic stuff. But I'm going to bring up his page. When I think of Jerry Goldsmith, I think of Gremlins. Okay. But he has done a shitload of good stuff. I want to say he's passed away though, <laughs> but maybe I'm wrong. If maybe. not, he's certainly up there. In, in yeah. Years. Maybe I, I could be thinking of James Horner. James Horner has definitely passed away, Horner's but Jerry passed, Goldsmith yes. and James Horner, I get, I get mixed up often. Uh, but IMDB is just being stupid and slow. Here we well, go. You, if you pull up, no, IMDb, he did pass I, away. I, Jerry I Goldsmith watched... passed away in 2004. <laughs> that shows how up to date we are. If you uh, pull up the IMDb page, which I had it up the other day because I watched Gremlins, and I clicked on the thing for composer to see who did it, and it was up there. And like I was, if you scroll down just a little bit, it's like you would know this person from this movie. And like the amount of movies I had rated at eights and nines of things that he'd done was ridiculous. And do you think I can remember what a damn single one of those are right now in this moment? No. Yeah. So. Uh, he's, he did, uh, Star Trek. He did like the Star Trek next generation films. So first contact generations. I don't, I don't like he a damn one of those, but anyway. Okay. Well, great. Uh, he All did right. the first mummy. Great movie. Like the score. Good a lot. score. Yeah. Uh, LA confidential air force one. Great M- movies. Mulan. The score to Mulan's pretty terrific as well. Okay. Gremlins total recall. Hmm. He, it looks like he's done. He did every Joe Dante movie. Oh, he did Supergirl. The eighty four movie. Yeah. Oh, sweet. Psycho two, which that score is pretty amazing. Poltergeist. You know what? I'm going to give him. I'm going to give him something weird and kind of out of the box. But because the the Total Recall theme's going through my head right now, I'm going to assign him to Cyborg. Oh, okay. Because he has just that that quirky ishness to his sound sometimes that I think that will work really good. And since nobody threw Daft Punk out there for me to lean on, I'm going to say him for Cyborg. All right, great. I'm okay with that. I was thinking Wonder Woman. Okay, I can go with that too. All right, next one is Hans Zimmer. Now this is a trick question because Hans Zimmer he's already done a Batman movie, he's done a Wonder Woman movie, he's done a Superman movie. <laughs> So then let's give him Green Lantern. Why not? Challengers of the Unknown. Or Justice League. He didn't want to do Justice League, so he handed it off to Junkie XL, but I think he would have made him awesome Justice League score. Fair enough. Let's go with that. I mean, he's he's the king of the ones that have been mentioned in this this particular email, so let's give him the big Yeah, show. give him the big yeah. one. Um, Harry Gregson Williams, he's awesome as well. He's is he the one. Wonder Woman or the Aquaman one? I don't That's remember That's Rupert is. Gregson Williams. That's his brother. Okay. Uh, Harry Gregson Williams uh, has done, well, Shrek. <laughs> but I do think that the best thing about that movie is the music. Uh, he has done, um, hold on. You can say what you want about those movies, but the part in two where the gingerbread man's wrecking stuff and the people run from the Starbucks to the Starbucks is still one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> um, okay, he's done. He did Shrek, Shrek 2. He did uh, Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas, which isn't a great movie, but oh my God, the score truly is terrific. That's the DreamWorks animated film. Uh, he did. Didn't even know there was one. Oh, dude, it's worth it's worth checking out. Again, the movie is fine, but the score is terrific. Uh, okay. He did Chronicles of Narnia. He did Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good score for that. So yes. yeah. Okay. He, he did X Men Origins Wolverine, another great score. No matter how you feel about the movie, he I guess he is the composer for movies I don't really like, but scores that are great. He did <laughs> Cowboys and Aliens. It's a great score. I don't really particularly care for the movie. He did the score for the Town. Oh, the Ben Affleck movie. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, he's he's great. Like Harry Gregson Williams is awesome. So, uh, what should he do? I'll give him Batman. Okay, I'm gonna give him Green Lantern. Okay. 
Uh, James Newton Howard. Oh, crap. We already gave John Powell Superman. I was going to say give James Newton Howard Superman, but if we already gave it to John Powell, what should James Newton Howard do? Because he's, James Newton Howard is great at like big, sweeping, romantic, heroic themes. And he worked on the Batman Begins score, yes? Yes, he worked on Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. And, hmm. but he did Woman. Treasure Planet. Wonder. He did Atlantis. He did Dinosaur. He's he's done a lot of great scores. Um, so I'm trying to think of something grand and heroic uh, that I haven't said already. I'm, I'm going to give him Wonder Woman. Okay. I mean, that was my other thought. It was basically Superman or Wonder Woman. All right. Well, Muhammad, yes, you put us on the spot. Uh, but there are some off the cuff answers for you. <laughs> um, let's move forward. Next message is from Bat Sam, um, also known as Samuel Sadowski. It says, Hey guys, like you, I was not wholly impressed with the look or tone of the Batman movie in the first trailer. However, with the second trailer, I thought this could promise to be the most cinematically beautiful Batman movie we've ever seen. I'm referring to the sunset, sunrise, rooftop shots. Also, seeing how Batman moves is important, and this trailer highlighted some of that. So, question one. Has the Martha Rescue become the standard by which all Batman fight scenes will be measured? Two. Could this next movie be as close as we get to seeing a Jim Lee or Jason Fabok-style Batman in live action? Best, Bat-Sam. Uh, thanks, Bat-Sam. Question one. Has the Martha Rescue become the standard? Yes. Don't you think? I mean, for me, I can't speak for everybody else, but in, in my perspective, it certainly has been. Yes. Yeah, I mean, as, as far as Batman fights, yes, in my opinion. And then, That scene never gets old, by the way, ever. No, it's terrific. Anytime somebody posts that scene up like in my Facebook feed or something, I click on it and watch it. I don't give a damn what else I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other question, could this next movie be as close as we get to seeing Jim Lee or Jason Fabok style Batman in live action? I'm going to say no. No. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't see either of those influences on this at all. Those those two guys are are legends of the industry for their artwork. Jim Lee is my favorite comic book artist of all time. You've all heard me say it before, and I'll probably say it till the day I die. Faybach is an outstanding artist in his own right, and mm-hmm. the guy is is a known name for a reason. He's a commodity. But in either case, I have to say, popular opinion or not, I don't think there's very much comic book aesthetic to be found in what I've seen for this movie so far. So no, taking two of the best in the business and saying that this is what as close to their work as we're ever going to see in a, in a film that to me doesn't look like it's terribly inspired aesthetically from a comic book. Absolutely not. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Fabok, he's almost the, uh, like successor to Jim Lee. It, it kind of feels that way as far as his. Yeah. And I mean, know, that the, is the, the highest possible compliment. Like I don't, certainly, I don't, certainly, yeah. certainly, you know, J- Jim's taken on a lot of different responsibilities with DC over the years and, and basically almost running the show now. So, Faybach, you know, they they would call Jim, and Jim still does some artwork here and there for, you know, especially for covers, but Faybach's become that guy where if there's a, a second or third variant on a, a book, you can almost bet your bottom dollar his ass is going to draw that cover. Because mm-hmm, yeah. he's, he's become that known for that sort of thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's a reason you want to, you know, get the best people in the business that you can for something like that. And he is, in my opinion, one of the best in the business right now. Mm-hmm. For sure. All right. Next message is from Christian. It says, Hey, Holy Batcast crew. It's been a while since I've written. As I'm writing this, I'm finishing up the Long Halloween Part 2 episode, and I'm stuck in the shittiest traffic imaginable. Uh, So sorry if I come off more aggressive, but traffic brings out the worst in us. I wanted to give my thoughts on the ending of the film with Gilda. So everybody, guys, this is is a spoiler talk. Um, I think the writers were making Batman more of a Sherlock Holmes in that moment than he's ever been, and I liked that. In the Arthur Conan Doyle Holmes books, there are several instances where Sherlock lets the criminals go because he sympathizes with their motives and believes that is a one-time occurrence. I think the difference between Gilda and Mr. Freeze is that Mr. Freeze won't stop committing whatever crime he needs in order to save Nora, whereas Gilda was getting one-time justice that the system couldn't give to her. Also, it's not the first time Batman has let someone go. I mean, in the Justice League animated series, he had Ace, who caused so much death and destruction, and he didn't cuff her and lead her off. He sat and stayed with her until she died. 
I also want to say that I appreciate Jamie's more charitable reaction to these films than his reaction to the Batman trailer. I notice sometimes that when he's really excited about something and it doesn't land for him, he has a harder time appreciating the things that do work and only sees the stuff that doesn't work. His reaction to the Batman trailer in the Fandom episode kind of rubbed me the wrong way, uh, not because I care about opinions that don't line up with my own, but because he seemed way more angry and aggressive about it than I think it deserved, even if it's aesthetically not what we would have chosen. Anyway, I'm getting a bit long-winded, so I'll leave you with a question. Have you seen the Justice League of America TV film from 1997? And if so, what did you think? Thank you guys for your excellent and hilarious coverage of the Batverse, and Andy, congrats on your impending fatherhood. P.S. Eugene Levy as Mr. Freeze is such a hilariously brilliant idea. When you said it, I burst out laughing. Uh, thanks, Christian. All right. So uh, the first thing was about the ending of The Long Halloween Part 2. Uh, I mean, I can't speak to the Sherlock Holmes comparison, but I can say that the Ace comparison doesn't really hold a lot of water because the difference is Ace was literally... There, there's that's a finality in and of itself. Yeah, so, yeah. she's he's, she's he's literally moments away so from death. She's not making them die in captivity. Yeah, she's literally moments away from death. Uh, so yeah, I just I, I don't quite uh, I don't think that's apples to apples. Um, but I also feel like I mean, it's not like Gilda, you know, stole some money from the convenience store. She literally murdered like how many people? <laughs> so uh, I don't know. I don't know. If, I, I still kind of stand by what we said in that episode. Um, as for, I mean, I don't know if you want to say anything about the Batman trailer, Jamie. I, I've said as much about that trailer as I want to see. I'll, I'll talk about it when there's another trailer or a movie to talk about. I, I just, he's probably right. I probably am more aggressive when I see something I don't like by nature. I'm that way. I get worked up and angry and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's how it goes. I think everybody's kind of like that more or less but yeah i mean and i, I also I, I just i think you I, have I don't more of a vested interest on a movie i haven't seen i i don't like what i see so far and i'm i'm trying to remain positive about the film and hope that uh the film overcomes those those problems that i have so far well and, and like i was gonna say i think you have more of a vested interest in this because it's the next big batman big screen movie so you have higher hopes for and it's, it it's probably going to be the next three yeah you have higher if, hopes if for it you're looking forward to it more than anything it's not like an animated batman movie where you go oh i'll wait three months there'll be another one coming um this is going to be the cinematic batman for yeah probably the next decade so you're you you, you want to like it more which means you're going to feel more strongly about it and maybe i will but so far i'm just not there yet yeah um, did you see the Justice League uh, failed pilot from 97? No, I didn't know there was one. Oh, man. Uh, I have seen it. I bought. I remember buying a bootleg of it way back when because I heard it existed. Um, I remember kind of liking it, if I'm being honest. Not because I thought it was great. It's not great. It's kind of a mess. But I liked it just because it was this really weird, random thing. Uh, and at that time, I just seeing any version of the justice league in live action was enough to get me excited. I was going to uh, say in, in that era, any superhero content was welcomed and accepted with open arms. Cause we weren't spoiled ass brats like we are right now with the content. Exactly. So it's so cheesy. I can totally understand why it did not get picked up to series because it's pretty bad. Um, but it's, there's fun to be had in the badness of it. I mean, think about this and, and I don't want to get into a whole thing here because I love like 75, 80% of Smallville. I really do. I was a fan of that show. But do you think Smallville would be as widely appreciated and accepted and, and, and loved if it was released right now in the middle of all the other stuff that's floating around with superhero content? Because I, I, I doubt it. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. Just that that's an example of the era that we were in. And, and again, I think there's way more to love about that show than not. But again, during that time, we all you had to do was say superhero. And we were like, yes, give it to me. I don't care. Yeah, and we were we, starving. We, we'd watch it as often as we could. Mm -hmm. One of these days we should cover it on the show. It's it's pretty ridiculous. They should put it on HBO Max. Why the hell not? It's not, I'll tell you, it's not a Star Wars holiday special on Disney Plus and they haven't yet. Yeah. I was say, it's not as good as the Aquaman failed pilot that we reviewed way back when. That was pretty good. Because that I, was actually I, pretty good. Exactly. I, I like that. I really did. Yep. 
Um, all right, let's move on. Next message is from Mark Bickford. It says, hey, BatFam, uh, thanks for reading my recent email with the SNL question. I thought it was ironic that Jamie picked John Belushi to play The Flash because per both my memory and Wikipedia, the particular form of drug ingestion he was involved with at the time of his death was called a speedball. <laughs> uh, in honor of that great man, what is your favorite John Belushi movie? More Bat-related, one piece of Batman-related news I haven't heard you discuss is is the new DC Batman-themed restaurant in London. Do you plan to talk about that? I don't expect an in-person review. London is hard and costly to get to with COVID. Uh, Although I hope Andy is hiding the phrase Universal Studios Wembley in all of his work emails. Uh, He has a baby on the way and prices at the place run the gamut from incredibly expensive to insanely expensive. But there are quite a few stories and reviews out there now, so I'd love to hear you talk about it. Maybe one of your UK listeners is in the position to scope it out and report back. Many thanks for a great show, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Um, All right. It's time to send Lee and Tracy in to buy a $300 cheeseburger. So exactly. Exactly. I, I'll, I'll buy their lunch if they want to go and report back. Um, first of all, favorite John Belushi movie, Jamie? I don't know if I have one. Okay. Because the, the ones that I've seen that I can think of right now off the top of my head, I don't really like. Animal House, Blues Brothers, just... Hmm. Nothing against John Belushi. I just, I, I don't like most of the movies that I can recall that I've seen him in. All right. Um, I mean, I think mine is the Blues Brothers. It's not like it's like one of my all-time favorites, but I think that, yeah, if I, I'm looking at the list, I'm like, which one do have I have I seen the most or I'd be most interested in revisiting? It probably is the Blues Brothers. Uh, I do like Animal House. I also like, again, speaking of So Bad It's Good, there's a movie called Neighbors with him and Dan Aykroyd. That's just I mad- vaguely remember. Oh, that. it's madness. Vaguely. It's like it's pretty well forgotten, but I also had a soft spot for that one. Um, anyway, the London DC thing, I I've seen bits and pieces of that online. It looks really cool. I do want to go. Yeah. When will I? I don't know. It'll be a long time, uh, but I appreciate the heads up. And yeah, I guess I need to do a little more investigation into that. Um, All right, next message is from Todd Johnson. It says, hey guys, I did a spit take when you were asked to cast a 66 Batman reboot. Me and my buddy did this a while ago. Some of the ones that I had that were different were Zach Galifianakis as Robin, (laughs) because he's hilarious. Um, Patrick Stewart as Mr. Freeze. I think he would kill it. Fred Armisen as the bookworm and Sarah Silverman as Catwoman. Please, Andy, use your Hollywood influences to make this happen. Uh, Off subject, what did you think of No Time to Die? It's all about Batman and Bond in my world. Keep up the great work, Todd. I don't think this is from Todd. I think this is from Brendan. (laughs) I'm not buying it, Todd. I know who you are. Uh, Anyway, anyway, um, the Patrick Stewart is Mr. Freeze. Like, I didn't pick that because I want that. I I mean, maybe he's, he's gotten old, but I wanted that in a movie, damn it. That was a huge missed opportunity back in 97. Well, not only is he a very good classically trained actor, but that cat does not get the credit he deserves for some of his comedic timing stuff. Oh, too. that's true. That is true. He, he is he's, he's a funny guy. So I, I could roll with this choice in, in that role. But uh, you, you mentioned Galifianakis, Sarah Silverman and Fred Armisen. My friend, you and I are cut from a different cloth because I can't stand any of those three people in the least in <laughs> any capacity. Ugh. Um, well, Zach Galifianakis is Robin. I'm I'm not feeling that. Um, but I like Fred Armisen as Bookworm. I think that's actually really fun. I could character choice wise that works, but yeah. I, I don't. Armisen just ugh. yeah. He, he he rubs me the wrong way. Um, and No Time to Die. I have not seen it. I think it was very good, but I think it's middle of the road for the Craig Bond films. Okay. What's so crazy? I remember messaging Brendan going, hey, how is it there's a new Bond film and I haven't heard you say boo about it? And he goes, because we don't get it for months. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, there you go. I mean, he just got Ghostbusters like two days ago. What's weird is I do feel like No Time to Die, it came out, it did make a lot of money, but I I don't remember seeing any real reactions to it. Oh, there's a huge spoiler thread where we were all fighting about it. Oh, movie. really? I I'm surprised it. you didn't see that. No, I there's also it. one for Ghostbusters where we're all fighting about it, too. Oh, great. Because guess what? I seem to be the only person in the world that didn't like the new Ghostbusters movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, I liked it, but some of these reactions feel a bit overblown to me. <laughs> uh yeah, I, I don't want to get into the whole thing here. Let's just say uh, if you guys loved it, great. I'm glad it worked for you because 
I'll watch the first one and the 2016 one before I'll watch two or this one. Oh. Every single time. 10 out of 10. Oh, hot take city. Okay. Uh, all right. Next message is from our pal Mark Jurasevic. It says, hey, Batcasters, many thanks for your passion and time produce or time to produce the best superhero podcast. Uh, as you know, Marvel has recently produced and will soon release the series based on Batman-inspired heroes like Daredevil and Moon Knight. On that note, did you enjoy, enjoy the Daredevil series, and are you looking forward to Moon Knight? Do you think that Charlie Cox and Oscar Isaacs would have made a good Bruce Wayne and Batman, respectively? Take it easy, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Uh, what do you think, Jamie? Uh, did you like Daredevil? Are you looking forward to Moon Knight? And do you think I these... still haven't seen the most recent season of Daredevil. I think there's three seasons in total, if I'm not mistaken. So think, I've seen yeah, the first right. two, and I really like the first two a lot. I haven't seen the third yet. Uh, Moon Knight, I'm certainly looking forward to because I feel like I was one of the few people that really liked Moon Knight as a character. They, they kept trying to make him a thing in like the, the mid to late 80s, and he just never really caught on in, in the comics. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see him getting his due. I mean, if you talk to the right people, they'll just tell you he's basically Marvel's Batman ripoff, which I think is about seven characters. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for Moon Knight and... Charlie Cox as, as Bruce Wayne or Batman, maybe. Oscar Isaac, hell yes. That, yeah. that cat's a great actor. Yeah, co-signed about that. Charlie Cox, maybe. Oscar Isaac, definitely. Um, I liked the Daredevil series, but much like what we just talked about, I didn't love it the way everyone else did. I just felt like all the Netflix Marvel series let me down because uh, they all seemed afraid to be superhero shows. Uh, and like, yeah, much like we talked about the Titans, Daredevil just didn't want that show just they just didn't want him to be daredevil it was just it was very frustrating to me um moon knight yeah I'm, i guess i'm waiting for a trailer i'm kind of intrigued but um i mean i haven't i haven't watched loki i haven't watched hawkeye so i've really sort of fallen off with a lot of those so maybe moon hey, knight guess, will guess get what me back. Let, let me get it even more on people's popular christmas card list i hated the loki series too <sighs> hawkeye i'm i'm one episode into that and i'm not gonna say i love it but i will say i really like it all right Haley Steinfeld's a great actress. Yeah, I, I really hope she gets her due. Um, all right. Next uh, message here is from Josh Weber. It says, I recently found your show and I love it. As a huge Batman fan, it's nice to listen to other Batman fans discuss Batman things. I've been uh, hotboxing archive episodes and I really enjoy it. You've gained another listener. I think Angry Jamie might be my spirit animal. <laughs> he speaks my language. I love the down to earth tone of your discussions. You and your crew keep up the good work. I look forward to sending in questions and hearing your takes. Until then, joygasm. <laughs> All right, we're, we're, thanks. Try, we're trying to put angry Jamie in the box. We're trying to stay more banner Jamie than Hulk Jamie now. I mean, here's the thing about here's the thing about it. Like, you get angry about something, half the listeners are like boo, and the other halves are like I love it. So, there's something to be said for that. I I guess, but you know, it's effort, it, dudes. Let's all go get a beer. I mean, life life's too short to be mad about everything all the time. Right. These these are lessons I'm learning as I go. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Next message is from our pal Chris, the objective geek. It says, Hey guys, hope all is well. I've got questions, but first, Andy, congrats on the Batgirl announcement. As a bat dad myself of a Batgirl and two Robins, it's a great experience. Funnily enough, when picking a name for her, I was trying to think of Batman DC related names. I asked my wife, what about Selena? And her response is, why would you name her after a nineties Latin pop artist? <laughs> I lost that argument. Uh, anyway, question. I love the podcast. I've been listening since 2014 as you were building up to BVS. That being said, I wish your podcast had been around even longer so we could hear your reactions to trailers, character first looks, and news announcements from previous projects. But we can't change time, so what were your initial reactions and how has your opinion changed on the following? Arnold Schwarzenegger cast as Mr. Freeze, Batman Begins, Heath Ledger cast as the Joker, Heath Ledger's first look as the Joker, first look at the Dark Knight suit, Young Justice TV show announced, Affleck cast as Batman, and Gal Gadot cast as Wonder Woman. I was too young to care about Mr. Freeze casting. I thought Batman Begins was a good film, but now it's my favorite of all time. I thought Heath would do fine. I was so confused as his, with his first look as the Joker. I thought it wasn't the final look. I didn't care for the Dark Knight bat suit, but now it's my favorite. I thought Young Justice looked like a neat Y7 show. Wrong. I absolutely hated the casting of Affleck. Wrong. And I thought Gal looked the part was, was concerned about her acting. Very wrong. 
Sorry if that's a lot. Keep up the great work. Chris, a.k.a. The Objective Geek. Thanks, Chris. Always good to hear from you. And, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about our own little Batgirl who's going to be coming in just about two months, which is really scary. I'm going to tell you right now, you name that kid Leslie Tompkins D. Genova, and I'll pay for her college. Oh, well, let me let me tell <laughs> Catherine because that might be worth it. Uh, I, I love this question. It's actually really fun of like, hey, you know, if the show was around, what would you have said? I want to say we talked about the Affleck casting on the Real Fans show. I think you're right. Because that would have been March of 2013. And we were kind of on point with all the movie news as things were coming out. So. Yeah. Back when there was only one show, we, we covered it there. And the fact that we were all within three hours of each other time zone wise. Yeah. And I think that we might have even talked about Gal Gadot on that, but I can't remember. We did. We definitely did. Yeah. Uh, but okay, let's if, do if it. If not Batcast. I don't remember which one. Yeah, I, I don't either. Um, all right, but this is kind of fun. Go back in time. What was your initial reaction when Arnold Schwarzenegger was cast as Mr. Freeze? I mean, I especially back then, but even to this day, I'm still a big Arnold fan. I love the guy. I grew up on his movies. My father took me to see every Arnold movie from The Terminator on until the point where I went and started seeing him by myself without him. So uh, I thought it was a strange choice, but I was in on it because, hey, I'm, I'm an Arnold guy. And that it's a Batman movie with Arnold in it. Why, what's not to like about this? And then the more I saw about the film and then watching the film itself, that that opinion drastically shifted. All right. Um, I was like, oh, that's terrible. That's a terrible idea. Uh, even when they announced it, because I was so disappointed with Batman Forever that I had zero faith in the sequel. And every decision I heard sort of reinforced that. And this was one of them. I was like, really? I love Arnold as the Terminator, but as Mr. Freeze, I couldn't see it. And then you were the what, movie... 16, 17 when Forever came out? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because I was 20, so I think I'm four years older than you if I remember right. Yep. Um, so yeah, so, and then I saw the trailer and I was like, God, it looks so bad. And then I saw the movie. So uh, that's one where I think my initial reaction was correct. I just was like, this is a terrible idea. And uh, it was. <laughs> Um, Batman Begins, your initial reaction to that? Uh, I think I've mentioned it before. Uh, I was still kind of scorched from Batman and Robin, even though it was seven or eight years later. I was interested, of course, for a new Batman movie, but this is that one rare Batman movie that I can think of in my lifetime where I wasn't there opening night for it. I saw it the following Thursday on Guys Night Out at the Movies that we used to have every Thursday night with my wife's brother and our mutual friend. And of course I was blown away in watching it. And that raised my cinematic Batman excitement levels back up to the point where they have remained to this day. But uh, yeah, initially I, I, I was into it. I don't, I don't, I wasn't like keeping up with a lot of movie news or anything. So I feel like the trailer dropping was literally my first thing about that movie happening. And I was like, huh, but I still wasn't like over the moon about it because of the, that hurt feeling thing about, Batman and Robin, mm -hmm. yeah. even though you could clearly see from the trailer that this was not going to be that same movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like I have talked about in the past, but I was pretty lukewarm leading up to its release. I was interested. Of course, I was going to go see it, but I was not like this, like frothing with excitement the way I, I often get with Batman movies. Uh, and then when I went and saw it opening night, I walked out blown away. I was like, that's the best, best Batman movie I've ever seen. And... Now, however many years later, how long has it been? 16 years later? I still think it's probably the best Batman movie I've ever seen. Uh, so, yeah, I, I maintain that. Like, no, it completely knocked me off my ass the first time I saw it. And then I drug a bunch of other people to see it that summer. It's still one of my favorite movies. Uh, and I still think that, in my opinion, it's the best Batman movie. I don't ever even contest that. You know, there, there's always discussions and the dark Knight is my clear runaway favorite of all of those films and of any film really. Uh, but anytime anybody puts up the argument that they think Batman begins is a better movie than the dark Knight, I, I, I offer nothing of resistance to that because I see it. I get it. I yeah. understand. Yeah. I, I just mean, happen to prefer the dark Knight. No. And I agree with that too. It's like, honestly, like between the two, whichever one you pick, I got your back. Like great. Cause they're both freaking awesome. 
And there's even that rare person out there, and there there's more than one. It's not just like a single person that thinks that Rises is the best of those movies. And you know what? I'm I don't agree with that, but I'm like, all right, I respect it. That's it's ambitious say, saying that out loud as as much as that movie in itself was ambitious. So mm-hmm. I, I get it. Yep. Um, all right, Heath Ledger cast as the Joker. What was your thought I was back then? Way against this, I was so far. I was like, "What the hell?" And the only thing I knew of this guy from at that point, having seen with my own eyes, was playing the oldest son of Mel Gibson in The Patriot that came out in two thousand, I think it was, the the Roland Emmerich movie, which I still think is a great movie, by the way. Mm-hmm. I, I just I, I looked at that and I thought, this young, good-looking blonde kid, he's going to be the freaking Joker. And I just, I, I just, I couldn't roll with it. I couldn't see it. And then turns out you were uh, right. He blew it. <laughs> yeah. The guy sucks. Uh, I mean, leading up to the next thing, you know, they, they had the, the, the production still or the first image or whatever of it. I think my reaction wasn't a lot different than that. I was like, eh, whatever. Well, when they announced his casting, I just sort of took it in stride. That tends to be my reaction with most of these castings. Most of it, I just am Damn fine you, with. man. Overreact to everything like the rest of us on the internet. But I feel like I've always felt that way. Like when Christian Bale was cast in Batman Begins, I went, oh, okay, cool. You know, like I didn't, I wasn't like, yeah, but I was also like, sure, great. See, I, I was because I was at that point, at that moment in my life, I was a bigger Christian Bale fan than I was a Batman fan. Uh-huh. So that, that news really did a lot for me. Um, and so when Heath Ledger was cast, I just kind of was like, okay, sure. I couldn't picture it, but I also didn't have any misgivings about it. I just went, oh, sure. That makes sense. He's kind of this hot young actor. He's the same, he's similar age and size to Christian Bale. So it makes sense that he would be the Joker to that Batman. Um, so I just sort of was like, okay, cool. And then the first look, I just, I didn't love it, but I also was like, hmm, I thought it was kind of an ugly image. I still think it's kind of an ugly image. Um, but it also was like not enough. There was enough in the shadows that I just sort of was like, I'll wait and see. Uh, and then I certainly like the the full look better than what that initial look was. I do remember that like when they released that initial first look of him, they had already thrown it on T-shirts at Hot Topic. And I was like, ew, who would want that on a T-shirt? Gross. Like, I don't want to wear that. <laughs> um, but again, that kind of just shows the excitement for the movie is that they had that... Uh, you know, they had just that image on a T-shirt, but I, I didn't want to wear it. Um, all right. First look at the Dark Knight suit. I remember this distinctly. It was Entertainment Weekly. I remember it and I went, awesome. Great. Cool. New suit. Looks great. I was into it. I had no issue with it. I mean, for me, I, I don't think I had an opinion either way to this day. And I know and recognize that there are differences between them, but I don't see enough difference between the Batman Begins suit and the Dark Knight suit to really say which one I would like better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that... Lit- th- literally the biggest thing that that suit change had to offer me was I still, th- to this day, think the it sure would make backing out of the driveway easier. That line is great. So, I mean, yeah. that, that's... That suit change generated that line. So, that that's the best I have to say about it. Yeah. I, I still prefer the Begin suit because it's a little sleeker, but... I thought this was still close enough while still offering some improvements for mobility that I was like, yeah, cool. Works for me. Um, The Young Justice TV show announcement. I don't remember it being announced, but what I do remember is this was coming out when I was working at WB. So I was walking through the WB back lot and I saw a poster for it. And I was very excited because I was like, oh, I really love the art style. Cool. So I was actually really excited about it. And then the show, boy, did it deliver. I did not care in the least in any way, shape or form until I believe it was you and Roman were like, dude, you need to watch this show. And I was like, yeah, whatever. And then after like the 46th time you told me I did. And I was like, okay, you're right. This show's freaking great. Yeah. And I think I was so excited about it because I never got into Teen Titans because I didn't like the anime art style at all. So when I saw the art style for Young Justice, I was like, okay, now that's the Teen Titans show I've been waiting for. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I went from literally not caring that show existed to I have it up on the mantle with the likes of Batman, the animated series, Superman, the animated series. I think it's up there with the best of them. Yeah, so do I. Um, Affleck cast as Batman. Do you remember? I never saw it coming, but the moment it was announced, I was like, huh, this could really work because 
for years, I was obsessed with how big somebody was that was going to play a superhero. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Affleck, if he wasn't already, could get that massive, intimidating size and shape of a, a big, bulky superhero like a Batman or Superman or something like that. So I was like, yeah, I think he's a little old, but I think this works. This this could really pan out. Mm -hmm. and, yep. And I was all for it. That, I, I'm proud to say that even though I think there was close to a 50-50 split over yes and no on that one, I, I always rode with the yes, and I think more people than not have shifted that direction after the, the BVS movie was released. Yeah, agreed. No, I, I was all for it. I've always been an Affleck fan, even uh, even when most people weren't. And so I thought it was great. I thought it was inspired. I was all for it. You can go back and check the tape. I was... Uh, I was vocally supportive of the choice from the beginning. And I, I think that was correct. I think he was a great Batman. Indeed. Uh, and then Gal Gadot cast as Wonder Woman. I was a little more mixed on, much like Heath Ledger. I was like, okay, sure. Um, there were other people who were in the running that I, I thought would have been, at the time, I thought would have been better. Um, but I was willing to go with it, mostly because I was just excited that Wonder Woman was going to be in a movie. But much like Heath Ledger, I couldn't quite picture it. Uh, because she was so thin in the Fast and Furious movies where I was like, oh, like she just I just can't see it yet uh, until we got that first photo. And then I went, oh, great. Perfect. So it was one of those where I like I was supportive, but not like over the moon excited. Uh, but I also was willing to trust Zack Snyder and go, OK, he must know what he's doing. And then once it was revealed, I was like, oh, OK, great. Now I see it. Uh, This one, I was. I wasn't like mad about it. I wasn't like, what really? This is where we're going to go. But like I had my heart set on somebody like Gina Carano or Megan Boone or, or somebody like that playing the part. They just, they look more traditional to what I think Wonder Woman should look like. Like I was obsessed with Gina Carano playing Wonder Woman because I knew she already had that fighting background and yeah. that, that physique and, and everything about her, you know, probably not quite tall enough, but I would have got over it for some of these other reasons. And then, you know, I started looking up. I was like, I don't know who a Gal Gadot is. I, I didn't know her name or anything else. And they're like, you know, most notable from the Fast and Furious movies. I'm like, all right, I've seen all of those. I should know who this is. And then I looked it up. I'm like, oh, it's that really skinny girl that they barely let talk. Mm -hmm. And then it dawned on me. They barely let this girl talk in a Fast and Furious movie. She must not be a very good actress. Now I'm biting my nails. Now I'm concerned. But, uh, you know, in, in hindsight... Sometimes I really like being wrong. And in that case, I was dead ass wrong and I was never so glad to be. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I was I was with you. I was team Gina Carano just physically. I like the idea of having a, a, a bigger, more muscular Wonder Woman. Um, so I was super into that until I watched Haywire. Yeah, that that will hit the brakes on it. Won't it? And I watched Haywire and when it came to action, yep, she was great, but oof, she could not carry a movie. And I was like, okay, maybe not. Maybe we dodged a bullet. Yeah, I think so. Um, all right, fun question, Chris. Appreciate that. Let's move forward. Next question is from Julian E., who I think is our new patron. Hey, Julian. He says, hey, guys, I appreciate all the hard work that you do to keep us Batman fans entertained. I listen to the podcast while I'm at work. It keeps me awake as I work the night shift. I was wondering if you guys have watched Eternals yet, and did you catch the two DC references that they made? Also, do you consider Wonder, do you consider Wonder Woman 1984 to be a Christmas movie? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Julian. And thank you for your support and we are happy to keep you entertained and keep you awake during your night shift um i still have not seen eternals jamie nope yeah when it's me. free on disney plus and i have nothing better to do then i'll watch it but i have no interest at this point yeah i mean i didn't really hear a lot of good things and it was one of those where like eh, i'll get around to it eventually and I just this is it. the least talked about marvel film that i can remember ever yeah so i'm i'm a little concerned about this one like yeah. even Black Widow generated conversation. This one I don't feel like has. Right. And that that kind of gives me pause. Now watch me. This will become my favorite Marvel movie because just I'm that guy. <laughs> um, Shang-Chi was great. Can we talk about that for a minute? Because damn, I love that movie. No, I agree. Shang-Chi is, is awesome. So I was super into Shang-Chi, but Eternals just haven't haven't gotten to it. I was on a cruise. I, I, I was on a Disney cruise and they were showing Eternals. It was opening weekend. And but it was only a three night cruise. And I was like, I don't want to spend two and a half hours of this cruise watching this movie that I hear isn't very good. 
Listen, I love Shang Chi so much. I was kind of mad I didn't go sit in the theater. I saw it in the theater. I was happy I did. Um, and then Wonder Woman 1984, a Christmas movie? No. Even though it ends on Christmas, I appreciate that. But no, I mean, 98% of the movie is not at Christmas. So I do not consider it a Christmas movie. I'm more likely to watch I mean, it at 4th of July. You can say the same thing about It's a Wonderful Life, but people still consider that a Christmas classic. I'm just saying. Well, I'm just I'm. I'd rather watch Wonder Woman 1984 during 4th of July because they have that awesome fireworks scene. Yeah, I, I think it's just a, a coincidental stamp on the film. I, I wouldn't classify it as a Christmas film. If it took place during like the week of Christmas, like Lethal Weapon or on Christmas Eve, like Die Hard, at that point, yes, I would count it. Or, or even the Shazam takes place right around Christmas. Oh, time. yeah, so like Shazam, I, I totally close. consider Christmas. Batman I, Returns. Right. I mean, that, that to me, that's a cheer watch. This Wonder Woman 1984... You know, even though I said it when we did the show, no, I, I really don't consider it a Christmas film. Yeah. All right, cool. We're going to do one more, then we're going to wrap up. There's still quite a few left. So we're just going to have to wait till the next time. Uh, this is from our old pal Stuart from Guernsey. It says, hey, guys, I'm just going through my annual Christmas podcasts by you on this show. Uh, real fans and everyone loves the Drake. So like last year, I'm going to request another Christmas special from you this year. Do you think there's any chance that you could cover Sleigh Ride, especially as you've already read it, Andy? I love the book so much. It's so underrated. Anyway, <clears throat> I hope you're all doing well and are enjoying the festive season, Stuart. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Always good to hear from you. Hope you're doing well. Um, I did just read Sleigh Ride again uh, last week, and I think I posted it on Twitter, which must be what you're referring to, Stuart. Um, we do want to do a Christmas episode. So, yes, um, I don't know if we'll do Sleigh Ride, but I like the idea. It sounds um, like less homework than what we're already considering. I mean, it is. It's a it's a quick read, but man, it's a fun one, and uh, I like the idea. So I will take that and discuss it with the gents off uh, off mic, and we'll decide what we want to do. But I appreciate the suggestion. We do love doing Christmas episodes. In fact, uh, Brendan is very sad he's missed the last few episodes. He does miss you guys, uh, but he literally goes, "But but what about a Christmas episode?" And so we'll figure it out. Have you read Sleigh Ride, Jamie? I think so, but I'm not positive. Well, it would be fun to talk about. So I appreciate it. Um, anyway, guys, we still have a few emails left. Again, just going to have to save those till next time. Uh, when you send us like whole long lists of things to react to or cast or, or things like that, it gets long. Um, but I want to, uh, I have plans for today, and I'm sure Jamie does as well. So we're going to have to get those next time. The next episode might be our Christmas episode, honestly, because today's already the 12th. Holy crap. I do um, have plans for the day. The Raiders are losing to the Chiefs at 1 o'clock. Great. Yeah. Um, so we're going to wrap it up for now. Thank you guys for writing in. Always great to hear from you. If you've got something for the Wayne Manor mailbox, you can send it to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. But that's where we're going to wrap up this episode of the show. A little bit of Titans, a little bit of Batman Beyond, and lots of random but very fun questions from you guys in the mailbox. That is uh, it's always good. Um, but Jamie, thanks for, uh, being up this morning and always good to chat with you about bat stuffs. Being up this morning. You, know, you dragged ass when you got on the call, man. I could have done this episode four hours earlier than that. I, I did. I did drag ass, but, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get my rest now before the baby comes. That's cause I hear that's important. You, you better start getting used to getting up early. That's all uh. We'll start, we'll start recording instead of nine o'clock Sunday morning. We'll start recovering recording at six o'clock Sunday morning. That's fine. She can just join. She can just sit here and while I record. Hopefully. And what she says will probably make as much sense as what I say half the time. So yeah, <laughs> let's do that. What do you we, think? We need more female minute. voices on this show anyhow. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, I, I was gonna say, tell our friends where they can find you, but not, not really anywhere. You just can't. here. I'm, I'm, I'm thinning out even more so as we speak. So no. Well, just stay tuned to the show, and Jamie will be here <clears throat> with his hot takes uh, that either you'll applaud or you'll be mad about, and then you'll email us about it. Either way, reactions are fun. Um, I already told you guys where to follow me, but thank you all for joining us. Thanks for downloading the show. Please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Uh, visit HolyBatCast.com or find Holy Batcast, uh on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Again... If you're uh, feeling like you need a little trimming, go check out manscaped.com and use the promo code BATSCAPED. 
Uh, if you've got something for the Wayne Manor mailbox, again, you can send that to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. A big thank you, uh, as always, to Gora Venkateshwar, who does our theme music. His work can be found at gvtunes.com. So on behalf of Jamie, I've been Andy. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Holy Batcast is not affiliated with Warner Brothers or DC Entertainment. The views and opinions shared by the participants are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the companies or organizations they happen to work for. Anyway, the suit's locked up. I'm benched. It's the way you want it, right? For now. Seeing Leslie was a huge step to getting back on track. I know it wasn't easy. I'm proud of you, son. Son? Yeah. The Ducati's gassed up. If this new girl likes cats, run. I'm going to take that moment to go release these dogs that are trying to dig their way out of the basement and use the bathroom real quick. Okay, take five.